worked on the water purification company, worked for a plumbing company, and I said our next crisis will be water. And I thought would be the availability yes. or no availability or very little Just availability water as a of commodity. water as a commodity or the pollution of it. But this is a whole new type of pollution that's called microplastics. As you can see by the June issue of Consumer Report, it's now coming to the forefront. And we want to bring a lot of information we found over the next couple of years because it is so encompassing. And it seems like every time someone does a study, they find out how how much is affected. They found it on the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean. Um, we have infected plastic. We found it in plankton, and we will show some videos yes. we have. So this is a very, very important subject. Please click on subscribe, click on like, and tell your friends about this. Every one should hear it. And for those that don't, that have heard the word microplastic but don't fully understand, yeah. uh, it is a broad definition. Uh, is there any piece of plastic that is smaller than five millimeters in size? Uh, that can be man made or just from breakdown. Yeah. Um, we have a primary microplastics, and those are the ones that are actually manufactured to be small microplastics. You can think plastic beads. Uh, glitter. Uh, they have um, any types of cosmetics, toothpaste, face washes. Uh, there was bar the ban, soap. bar soap. If yeah. it has any abrasives in it, mm -hmm. those are primary microplastics, and those were actually engineered to be tiny plastics. Uh, the secondary microplastics, which seem to be the primary in some form was banned a few years ago from cosmetics in the United States, from the body washes. Uh, but the secondary microplastics are a whole nother world of trouble. And that comes from just a breakdown of larger pieces of plastic. Uh, if you've ever let something sit outside that's plastic for too long, it starts discoloring, gets hard. That's the kind of breakdown that occurs. But in the ocean with the waves and the sun, it just breaks into smaller and smaller fragments. And those fragments don't go away. They just float around and are eaten by plankton. Uh, they're, they're eating my fish. Moves They're right up the shrimp. food chain. They're eaten by a lot of things, and they find their way not only in the ocean, but in the air. And we're going to talk about a number of ways that you would never dream that you have microplastics in your body. I can pretty much guarantee everyone listening to this, if they knew how much microplastics was in food, water, and their body, They'd be terrified. Well, in a previous episode we made uh, during the course of Earth Day, we were talking about how I had seen an article about microplastics, but grossly underestimated how much we were actually consuming. I think the statement was four to five credit cards over the course of a year. And in your research, you found something a, a bit more alarming. Apparently, we eat one credit card a week yeah. in microplastics. Now you say, how is that possible? Because if we took in so much, certainly we would feel it. Well, you, when they're so small, you're going to feel it in a different way. You're going to feel it in your immune system is going to be compromised because those microplastics are made up of materials which contain chemicals. And those chemicals Colorants. are released into your system. So I think it, it's a huge health issue. And we'll talk about that and deep dive into that. And we also have a statistic on how much microplastics are in your bottled water and the you source think of that micro. Buying bottled water, you would be getting You'd something be pure. You, yeah, but yeah, but, well, I've never felt that because I, yeah. in selling water, I knew that space at the top of your water bottles will grow bacteria. There's no doubt, and especially in Florida, if you leave a bottle of water in the car overnight or a couple of days and you go to drink it, well... Becomes its own ecosystem. Yeah, becomes its own ecosystem. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this, and then we're going to talk about the type of plastics and how they break down and get into the system. But the, the problem with the water bottle, I think, is a major one. Not only are there microplastics in the water bottle, the off-gassing of the bottles, plastic bottles we use, adds chemicals to the water. And then when you throw the bottle away, where does it go? Well, you see, I recycle it. 
Well, the, the ocean's recycling a lot yeah. of it. The beach is recycling a lot of it. So is when you ride down the road. Uh, and most of the stuff in the country is not recycled. I mean, we gave it a go, but we're not doing a very good job of it. But, and here's a, a chart. And we'll put, we'll put all these up on the website so you can see them. We have a lot of information. Nestle Pure Life concentration of the percentage of microplastics in bottled water. It, and this is, is this found a, per liter. Yeah, per liter. Six to 10,390. You know, that, and that's the size of it and how much. But when you go down, the number of plastic particles in that bottle of water is 390. They didn't particles. find a single bottled water company. No. That didn't have. Well, actually, Nestle and Avion had 0 to 256 or 0 to 74, depending on how lucky you are and which bottle yeah. you grabbed. Obviously, bottled in glass is the way to go, and we'll also talk about that. But you even go to Aquafina, Aqua, and most of the brands we know, they're not good sources. And we are going to talk about it, and we're going to give you solutions. We're not just going to tell you the problem of how you treat your water when it comes out of the faucet what you carry your water in. And there's simple solutions that'll definitely And even in it. laundry, a lot of people don't think of laundry yeah. as that is a massive contributor. So uh, let's talk about how it does get into the system and the type of things that do. One of the things that opened my eyes, we, we have a whole list here um, of how they get in the system. One of them I did not know, and I thought about it for just the rubber, was automobile tires. Now you'd say, well, tires, dust. You inhale microplastics. Think about this. The dust that comes off a car tire, 60% of your automobile tires are plastic, 40% are rubber. I didn't know that. And this. it makes up 28% of the total distribution of microplastics in the ocean. That's amazing. But if you think the number of cars on the highway, the number of cars that run right by the ocean, yeah. uh, the, the good example is right out here on the street, right by the yeah. ocean. And, and it's that's what the happened. most desirable drive for most Americans is that coastline curving up the, all yep. those lakes, all, streams, yeah. water supply. It's in the air. You're breathing it. Uh, don't live near a highway if you do move tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> But that's just one of the – list some of the uh, others we've got yeah. there, Justin. The, the distribution – now, every time they do a study, these numbers change slightly. Uh, but from what they found, and they found it at the lowest parts of the ocean and up to in glaciers, it's everywhere. Uh, but synthetic textiles make up 35% of the microplastics in the ocean by estimate. Uh, that is the clothing that you're wearing, uh, any breakdown of – uh, fishing nets, uh, similar things like that that just naturally release these fibers and you can't see them. It's not like you're just throwing strings in the ocean and they're, that's what they're the tiniest particles uh, that still remain plastic. And it's just thicker than the width of a human hair. And what we're saying is when you have polyester clothes or 50% mm -hmm. cotton, 50% polyester, when you wash those, especially when they're new, they found up to 70,000 particles of microplastics go in the water. Per wash. They're flushed out per wash. And s but you can't really see no. them. They're so small. But the buildup over time and getting into the water supply makes it the toxicity of everything that touches it. An another uh, way is storage containers. Oh, we love our Rubbermaid storage yep. containers. I've gone to all glass. I got Pyrex. They do have the plastic top, but that does not touch the food. Do not heat food in plastic. Mm, that to-go container that people just throw in the microwave. Yeah. And, and tell the people you do business with, paper containers. You, when they bring you a sandwich, if you, you everybody I know, we just ordered yeah. to-go lunch and just since we're inside. Simple wax-coated well, this was just plain yeah, this paper. Was just paper, and this was Firehouse Subs. Give them a plug. They originated here in yeah. Jacksonville, the Sorensen Brothers. Great guys. They're doing it the right way. Your restaurant can do it the right way. 
And probably one of the biggest polluters overall is single-use plastic bags, and we get them everywhere. I mean, there's so much work to be done, but we've talked about this, Justin. We have to get it at the source because to think we can recycle all, it's just overwhelming. Oh, yeah. You can't do it. In laundry, people don't really think, you know, you clean out that lint trap. Yeah. That is exactly what we're talking about, but on a smaller scale going down the drain. Uh, everything is not just caught in the lint trap. You wash, it fills, it drains. Uh, and then your water uh, reclamation system has to deal with that. The filters are not small enough to get those microplastics out. And a lot of people don't know once that water's treated, if it's not potable, it's sent out into local waterways or to farming, which goes to irrigation and then back out into the waterways. And of course, people say, well, what can I do? How can I do all this? Treat the water at the source you drink. There are a number of things you can do with the water coming into the house, water conditioners. Uh, if you're going to buy water, treat it at the source, put it in a stainless steel water bottle. And we're going to talk about that. And we'll have links to all this. One of the solutions I found and I really love is a company called Rising Springs. I've got them right over top of the refrigerator with a spout use them great. all the time uh, and it's but what makes the, it special yeah it's from 2.2 miles within a mountain it has not been exposed to the elements some of the purest water in the world you can find comes from the sawtooth mountains of utah right here in this country and it's bottled on site so they don't have to process it move no. it and then and that's another thing yeah. people well this is pure water it comes from this well not if they send it two miles or three miles down the line it gets impure by the time it well, gets then they have system. to filter it at the other end yeah so what have you accomplished yeah and we'll put links in this episode and every episode we do this may be i don't know a three four part series that we're going to do because it is so much information for you. So we're we're giving you an overview right here, and then we're going to deep dive into each subject. Uh, but those things that you can do, and and some you will not be able to get away from. I know these little plastic sandwich bags and storage yeah. bags, but before we had them, talking about going back to the source and addressing it there, my mother put my sandwiches in wax paper because we didn't have plastic. The milk cartons, if we had milk cartons, were basically wax cardboard. The milk came in glass bottles. The soda pop was glass bottles and later cans. It's the plastic we have to get rid of, and we have to demand from the source, from the manufacturer that they they do that. When I'll give you, uh, when we went over the distribution, I'll give you an idea of just how bad the problem is. Uh, synthetic textiles are the number one contributor, uh, followed up by car tires. Uh, city dust is 24%. So just natural, just that breakdown that occurs of all those products. Uh, that's the road markings make up 7%. Marine coatings, 37 Personal care products, 2%. And it's interesting, plastic pellets, 0.3%. Now that is actually what is designed to be microplastics, only makes up 0.3% of the entire distribution. It's the stealth plastic, mm -hmm. the things you would not think would do it. Uh, and if you think of bottles in the ocean and all the plastic in the ocean. Trash Island. Trash Island, you, and we'll show a picture. Yeah. We're going to show a picture of Trash Island. Trash Island is depressing. It is depressing, but what happens? Sunlight, heat, waves, salt water eventually breaks down every bit of that into the. And you see them on the beach. Go to the yeah. beach, and you'll see this little piece or a bigger piece of plastic. Well, what happens to that? If you don't pick it up and throw it away, eventually it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and fish eat it, and Every animal eats it, and it's just a, a huge, huge problem. Yeah. So explaining what's on your screen, the plankton that are currently consuming these microplastics are not hunting out plastics. Uh, plankton eats as well, and what the plankton eats, uh, those little microbes attached to the plastic like a nice floating hotel. The plankton then sees the plastic, and it's like a buffet. 
they just they're like they're all right here and they swallow the plastic and then that starts moving up the food chain it's in their digestive system and devein your shrimp by the oh. way because shrimp are full of microplastics well, they're filter feeders yeah they are they're bottom yeah. feeders they're filter feeders catfish can you imagine mm. full of microplastics so definitely you must clean them so, Jim, what are the ramifications of people consuming microplastics? I know some of the studies are still out, but they have a pretty good guess as to how plastic does affect us. Yeah, there are. They can't conclusively say because it's such a new field and they don't have any long-term studies. But they can pretty much give you a general idea that uh, every bite of food you take and every sip of water, you're almost certainly taking in microplastics. In the air you breathe. In the air you breathe. So we're becoming microplastic hosts. Yes. It's what we are. And uh, the way they believe it's affecting us and will affect us much more greatly are the chemicals linked to these plastics and the effects on the, in creating health problems such as reproductive harm, adding to obesity, organ problems, and developmental delays in children. That's just scratching the surface. surface. We have no idea what yeah. it's really going to do as, to our bodies. I really think most of it leads back when we harm our bodies, when we overeat, when we don't exercise. It's our immune system that gets destroyed and our ability to fight disease an illness, as well, we've seen with COVID-19. Yeah. If it's fighting that, it's not fighting something else. Yes. If you're, if you're eating plastic, that's definitely a foreign object. Well, and there's a scientific study, and they now found that every day, one in five of your cells develop cancer, but your body fights it all. So think about that. And if it's busy yeah. fighting all the microplastics. You don't have much of a chance or you stay in just diminished health. And so the next thing it comes along, you get sick and you get sicker. So it, it's a, a terrifying thing when you really think about the amount of plastic already out there, the population growth we have yeah. and are having, and how much more plastic's going to enter the environment. And people say, well, we're recycling. There's been 8 billion tons of plastic produced since 1950 and less than 10% recycled. So recycling's not the problem no. of, oh, man, that's going to fix a problem because it's such a small amount. Now, if you do it at home, you think everybody's doing it. Most people aren't doing it. And then even the collection of the recycling you got the tire dust from the trucks. You got the fuel it's burning. You got the carbon footprint, as we say. A lot of cities are shutting down their programs. Yes. For it's just not cost efficient no. and people aren't doing it. So, again, we must go back to the source. It's when talk about drink good water, drink rising springs, drink, get as pure as you can. Buy more natural fibers when possible. Yeah. I, I try to buy either bamboo or cotton shirts and slacks, and I've thrown away so much polyester. Um, but uh, that's you've got to do those yeah. things to protect yourself. Well, and if your city doesn't have a recycling program, it does need to be a priority, and, and you do need to make some noise uh, where you can. Um, a lot of people don't understand what when they recycle, what happens to that material. And for years, uh, the same cargo ships that were bringing us all of our goods were being filled after they were emptied with our garbage, and then they were sent back overseas to be processed. It was cheaper for them to process all of our garbage than for us to process it ourselves. India, China, yeah. mainly China. They don't want our garbage anymore. I think we've sent them about enough, and they have no desire to fill those ships and bring them back with garbage. And the cities are making the decision that since they can't ship it overseas, they, it's not cost effective to do recycling here. So they're just stopping some of those programs. Uh, and, and they're burying most of them in landfill, yeah. which eventually will leach down into the aquifers and on and on again. Another problem with chi China, I believe it was China, if I'm wrong, um, there was an investigative report and they started following 
these ships and what happened. Yeah, they unloaded them. Then they went to the other end of an island and they dumped them back in the ocean. Just cargo ships full. And cruise ships used to be the worst. Yeah. Just and just dump everything waste. in the ocean. Yeah. yeah. So you can't police the globe. And this is why I say it must be at the source. It must not be produced. No gallon containers and plastic. Uh, and you'll never get rid of all plastic. Some yeah. things you have to have in those containers, some solvent, some things that you just can't put in. It's not cost effective to put in glass and not a good idea to have a solvent that breaks and goes everywhere. Yeah. So well, there's there certain things. The promise of plastic, I understand. I get why when it was manufactured, we said, oh my God, this is incredible. Yeah. All these synthetic fibers, they wick moisture away, they last longer, but you don't get anything for free. No. It's like Ben in The Graduate when he put his arm around and he said, remember one word, plastics. And at that time, that was it. Yeah. That's where everything was going. Yeah. And it went that way. Yeah. We're, we're living the ramifications of that. But we must take it out of the environment to the greatest degree we can. And that's what we're talking about. We don't want it in our bodies. You don't want it in your body. And it's one of those things that are stealth that you really don't see when you wash your clothes or when you drink water and you drink a bottle of water and you say, well, I don't see anything yeah. in it. That's how small it is. In every single water bottle tested. That that blew my mind. Yeah. That it wasn't just in some brand that's pulling tap water and filtering it. It's all of them. Um, and I, I made a joke uh, recently. I was at a gas station and uh, there was no employees at this gas station. Apparently no one wanted to work that day. Um, but they had all their crates of water sitting out front of the gas station, baking in the sun. And right in the <laughs> noon heat, just cooking. There you go. And you buy that and you think, okay, great. I'll take it home, refrigerate it. It's already off-gassed. There's guaranteed microplastics inside from the day it left the factory before it sat and baked And that heat br and it was breaking it down yeah. as you looked at it. Yes, uh, that is not a, a good thing to buy. No. I would not do that, but people did buy it. And stop drinking your car water after it sat for... Yeah, don't don't reuse plastic bottles, please. And I I used to uh, manage a gym, and people would get the same yeah. water bottle. Refill They'd fill it, it for months yep. till it got so soft. Oh. And then thinking, you know, is that breaking down? Yeah. Well, now I know it was. Yeah. Don't do that. Uh I mentioned Rising Springs a few times, and I do want to mention to people that we have a very good interview, which you did. Jim, yeah. I was lucky enough to speak to an expert on the subject of water quality and forever chemicals, and she taught me things that will lead me down many rabbit holes of, of yeah. knowledge. Good. Hoya hiked. Yeah. Uh, she's with Rising Springs. Uh, has made water her life, really. Uh, water filtration systems, water reclamation in um, cities. Uh, but she taught, the interview's going to be really soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was incredible. Good. The, the water systems are at least being looked after by someone I know cares about it. And uh, you guys definitely watch the interview. Uh, we'll have a link down in the description so you can find it uh, once it's released. But she is from Rising Springs and made it apparent that it's not just another water company. It's not someone just bottling water. It, it's what makes Rising Springs unique. And mentioning people who are looking after water in every city, probably their river keepers or yes. ocean keepers or people who are dedicated to protecting the environment and making sure the water is as pure as it can be. And we could do one whole show on who's oh, polluting yeah. the ocean and polluting our rivers. But we, we have to stick to microplastics right now because that's what we want to talk about. And speaking of those, there's another little tidbit for you. Americans ingest at least 74,000 microplastic particles each year. And that's why they came up five grams a week roughly the equivalent of a credit card. And that's from this issue of yes. Consumer Report, June 2020. It said, and here's something, how does another reason it affects health? There is 
evidence, at least in animals, and by the way, we are animals. We like to forget that. Yes, uh, that microplastics can cross the hardy membrane, protecting the brain from many foreign bodies that get into the bloodstream. And there's some evidence that mothers may be able to pass microplastics through their placenta to a developing fetus, according to research from Rutgers Center for Urban Environmental Sustainability. It's just so small. Go right to the baby. It can slip right through the cells. Yes, scary stuff. Very scary stuff. And it it's it's easy to forget that it affects us all. When and here we have a clip with Nicoya from Rising Springs. Uh, she'll be going over what makes Rising Springs so special, but we'll include a link down in the description to the full interview uh, once that's released. Rising Springs is bottled out of a source in Pine, Idaho, about an hour and a half outside of Boise, Idaho, at the base of the Sawtooth Mountains. Um, the Sawtooths are in the largest contiguous wildlands in the United States, so the source is incredibly protected. Um, the water itself rises from an aquifer from 2.2 miles deep, making it the deepest source in the United States. And it's protected by this granite batholith, which is the largest granite batholith in the world. And the water itself fell as rain or snow about 16,000 years ago. So it fell before any type of environmental or man-made contamination. So it's never come in contact with our modern day world. As the water rises, it comes up through two miles of quartz crystal, so it picks up the silica out of the quartz um, on its journey to the surface. It also comes out at a pH of 9.4, so it's got a high alkalinity, and um, the water is pure to parts per quadrillion, which is the smallest um, particle we could test down to, free of, like I said, any type of modern day contamination, including the plastics um, that you are discussing. Yeah, so that journey we were speaking to, I, it took us about a year to really dive into packaging. And when we first, you know, had decided, yes, we did want to relaunch the brand, we had assumed we would go into glass. And we knew we were going to be a direct-to-consumer company. Um, when we started researching glass, it was clear that, you know, the carbon footprint was much higher than we had realized. And, um, you know, just from the production and the transportation to the recycling, um, you know, it had a high impact. And so we really, we were hopeful for a lot of, you know, new technologies, plant-based plastics, all these different, you know, things we had kind of heard about. And we researched all of them and none of them were viable for the product at this time. Um, we hope that they will be soon. But we, when we saw the bag and box technology that we most of us are familiar with wine coming in yeah. a box, um, and we started researching that, it, you know, the, such a low carbon footprint for the volume of water that we're transporting. And so that seemed to be, that was a great idea. We did know that we needed to um, offer and support a way to upcycle the plastic liner that's inside, which is a lot less, significantly less plastic than you would have if you had that in single serve. And it's, um, you know, the BPA, BPF, BPS free. And we test for, for a leakage. So we test all of our, um, batches and we let them sit I think you know from a year ago or however long I'm not super great on <laughs> those numbers but you know we test for any phthalate leakage into the into the water it's ne there's never been any which makes us feel really good so then it's about you know so we feel like the consumer is is well cared for so what do we do with the plastic um to to be responsible and we first thought that 3D printing would be an amazing option. And we did, you know, we sent the plastic off and yes, there is the ability to do that, but we would have to just gather tons of yeah. plastic bags and we're just not that big of a company uh -huh. right now. So we found a company in Boise, which will upcycle every part of the bag, the spout, even the little tag that you pull off the safety seal into synthetic diesel. And so for now that seems like the best um, upcycling option we have we stay you know very involved in what our options are and are are very conscious of um of our and remain remain flexible with our ability to pivot if needed you know and so when there's other options available we will look into those so 92 percent of public water supplies in the tap water uh, test positive 93 percent of bottled 
uh, water tested positive, and those are the chemicals that we actually have identified to test. So that makes things. And we know, and we won't get into it right now, but you can watch Dark Waters if you want yes. a, a, a nice movie to watch uh, to, to enlighten you. It may depress you, but Dark Waters. You need to know is, it, though. You need to know it. Watch, watch that movie, Dark Waters. Yeah, when we start pulling back the veil on how this has come into our lives, and I believe no one started off, no company, no individual, with the intention no. of harming anyone. No. Microplastics, the way they've come into our life, the intention was easy to carry, easy to make, cheaper. And actually, environmentalists pushed it because they wanted to save the trees. No paper bags at the grocery store. Don't do all this paper everywhere is terrible. And the promise of recycling, yes. being able to con continually reuse it. Well, as we say, the chain has broken. Yeah. We're better off to go back. And now we're doing much better with forest, replanting them, them growing. And what I like to point out about timber and forest is that, oh, we have so fewer trees than we ever have. No, we haven't. You, people never take into account linear foot of trees. For the last hundred years that we've been around doing this, they've been growing up too, not just out. So they're much more dis density in lumber than you think. Not that we shouldn't mass tear, you know, clear cut everything, yeah. but it's sustainable and we can do this. Uh, and they help us breathe. So we do have to look out yes. for them. <laughs> And if we're going to recycle, what's easier than paper to recycle? Yeah, so. Yeah, breaking the down the paper is, the promise of microplastics is it's difficult to break down. It lasts forever. Uh, that was the, that was the ploy. That was the sell. But the problem is it does. It does exactly what they say it will do. It does. It, it will outlive the container. It'll outlive the product. Um, you don't need milk that spoils in 14 days to be held in a container that lasts for 3,000 years. Or however long it yes. lasts. Yeah, you know, who knows if you're a really perfect environment, yeah. uh, how long a piece of plastic would last. Um, but if we don't, again, I'll go back to if we don't attack it at the source, it's not going to make any yeah. difference. It has to be done there. If you like what you're hearing, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel because we do more than water. We do a lot of things from uncovering military secrets to investigative reporting in our government, which I've been doing for about 40 years. And if you have any ideas for a future episode, please do contact us at contact at hackingthetruth.com. And uh, we'll be able to email you back and hopefully open up a dialogue and see what you'd like us to investigate. And we'll do it. We are mobile now. Yes. <laughs> and we want to be mobile. We've been in this uh, studio far too long with COVID-19. Yeah, COVID threw we, a wrench in everything. How many, uh, I don't know how many people we've got lined up to interview, but it's a lot. Yes. So we have a couple years work by the time we start getting to them, which is a good thing. Yes. And we love remote interviews, but it's so much nicer to sit across from someone, sit next to someone at a table and really engage with them and, and learn from them. Yes, very much so. Uh, you know, Justin, talking about, you know, some things you can do to minimize the problem. And one of them is vacuum your home. Minimize household dust because we're talking about off gassing, but everything you touch the plastic is wearing down. One of the biggest culprits is your carpet. Years ago, when I was growing up in the Stone Age, most carpets were wool. They were natural fibers. Now most of them are po some type or all polyesters. And when you walk on those, what happens? It goes into the air. You breathe it. You roll around on the carpet with your dog, with your children. You're breathing. So... Vacuum your carpets. And we've asked for the synthetics. It's not that yes. the manufacturers have just decided to give us something that we don't want. We asked for carpet to either outlast us, outlast the home, or the stain resistance. They'll spray it with products, which are plastics. Not good. No. And aerosol particles is a real problem also. 
because anything with aerosol, anything to do with chemicals, has microplastics in it, even much smaller than the five microns. And you know, when I when I say go to the source, yes, you have to write letters. You're going to have to be proactive. There's got to be a call to action because if you wait for everybody else to do it, it's not going to happen. No. We're sending links to this to newspapers, to editorials, to anyone that has anything to do with the, the ocean. Water Alliance. Jean-Philippe uh, Cousteau, yeah. Surfer Magazine. These people need to watch the show, see what they can do, look at the links we provide, and take action. Now, if you're waiting for your politician to do it, uh, a politician is a person who cuts down a tree, stands on its stump, and gives you a talk about conservation. So I don't have a lot of faith in the politicians. We have to act. No. But you can pressure them. If they're scared about mm -hmm. not being elected, then they will do something. Yeah. But the quickest way to get them to act. Yes. Threaten their funding. <laughs> yes. And they are heavily funded by chemical companies. So and the plastic manufacturers and the people who don't want to change. But I will say change can be brought about if you watch the Jane Goodall documentary they did. And Conoco, who was a big evil in their community, she sat down. She says, no, we're not going to protest. We're not going to do. So she was able to sit down with the president and the board of directors, explain her position. And they started seeing things her way. No yelling, no screaming, no threats. Just clearly stating your position and your goals. Yes. And it happened. Well, most communities, I know Jacksonville is, uh, Jacksonville has these you will find local cleanups in your area. If you do want to take part, if you do want to help, please go online. Uh, you will find a local cleanup in your area some weekend. Go out. Give them a few hours of your time. It will make a difference. The problem's so big, it might seem overwhelming, but even a little part helps. And we have crews, uh, especially after the 4th of July fireworks, mm -hmm. or you come to the beach, and there and are literally hundreds of people to volunteer to clean the beach up. So it can be done. Yes. And Jim, as we were going through microplastics, we really wanted to offer people some solution other than just panic and terror. Uh, you came across some really nice options other than Rising Springs, which is the primo water. Uh, but what all have you come up with uh, for solutions for every day? Well, we talked about going to the source and treating your water at the source and the source being when it comes into your house, number one, we're going to talk about water today. And I've been in the water business for over 40 years. And I've always said, you know, well, in Florida, we have a lot of uh, dissolved minerals in the water. So water conditioners are pretty prominent. Uh, formerly, I had a whole house charcoal filter to filter out all the impurities. Of course, during this time, I knew nothing about microplastics and how much they were in the environment. But I have a couple of solutions here, or we have a couple of solutions we can offer. Uh, my first choice is Rising Springs. And I say that because it's the purest water we found. And you saw in our segment a small interview, and we have a much larger interview we're going to play later. But when it is right out of the mountain, 2.2 miles deep, and I drank at least two full glasses every morning. Flush the system, be healthy, great thing. And just what do you take your water in? And we'll talk about the different bottles, but they have a great package. And here's a Rising Springs canister here, stainless steel, no plastic. We need plastic, and this is great. And also, I believe there's a discount for this, isn't if they order? Yes, there's uh, subscription services and single services, but we have uh, an affiliate link down in the description where you'll be able to get a little bit better deal than just the general public uh, on either shipping or the product itself. So just check the link in the description and you'll be able to access that. And there's another product that we use quite a bit, and it's a countertop uh, filtering system. And I'll just grab this box. And this system is great. I, yeah, it is. It's uh, it's an Apex system. Now, you can go to their website. We have a link below, 
and look at the different kind of filtering systems. I have this on my kitchen sink in there and hooks right up and you just turn the knob and the water comes out. But this actually balances the alkalinity of the water and it is about a six process filtering system. I highly recommend it, I use it. And there are a lot of them out there you can shop, but at least take a look at this one and see what you think. So there are two solutions, I use them both. Um, what impressed me about this is I had a water filter that I installed years ago in an apartment and the waste was incredible. You would lose about two gallons of water for every gallon that it was processing. This seemingly has little to no waste. Um, and I think the water tastes better uh, than the Oh yeah, the you're system going through a carbon filter. This actually does filter microplastics. So this is a great filter to have. And you say, well, why don't you just use rising springs all the time? Well, I don't want to put it in my coffee maker. Yeah. You know, we make a lot of coffee we around do. here. But so these are two products that can definitely protect your health and your family's health. Just some of the small things, not small things anymore. Uh, I firmly believe what you should be doing. Well, and this was a very simple install, correct? Yeah, very. I mean, it was, you just screwed it into the actual, um, the nozzle head. Yes. Couldn't have been easier. I had to go under my sink and redo piping and it was quite a nightmare. This is worlds ahead. And we are going to put up a link to everything you'll see below. Yeah. And also, uh, I bought a shower, a new shower head that has a filtering system in it that is one of the best I've ever used, and we'll put up a, a link to that also. Well, I haven't told you about that. I told you I no. was going to try it out, and it's great. Well, a lot of people forget that when you're in a hot, steamy shower, all the water that's in that shower is just aerosolized. So if there's plastic in that water, you're now breathing it um, as well as showering in it. Yes, you are. And let's also, here's another type water container, stainless steel, large mouth. Uh, I have several. I use them both because I keep one in the refrigerator ready to go when I head out the door because I want the water cold, especially here in Florida when today I think it's 94 degrees with a 97% uh. humidity. Uh, and this is a nice one also. This would be, these would be our two recommendations, yeah. and it's a Takaya or Takia. And it's double line, doesn't sweat. You can put hot or cold in it, and both of them are that way. So these are some of the simple solutions you can do to avoid your exposure to microplastics. And health-wise, it is imperative that you do this. And it's good that everyone can't subscribe necessarily to a water service like that, but a filter like that will get you as close as you can come yes. to something like that subscription service. And it's, you can replace the filter constantly as, as necessary. I believe it's a six month to a year, depending on, on how many people and yes. how many gallons um, you can do that. But something has to be done. You can't just turn your back and and say, uh, it doesn't affect me, it affects you. No, it affects you, and uh, with any kind of filtration, I sold them for many, many years. You can do a whole house system. Uh, part of the problems with whole house, you're treating water that comes into your toilet, so you're paying a lot of money uh, that things, you wash dishes yeah. with, that you wash your hands with. You really wanna treat it at the source you're drinking it uh, under the counter, put in the unit. This goes under the counter, and they have several, several options. Uh, of course, if you can't do any of those, buy as much rising springs yes. as you can and get pure water. Just get a good Bottle source. Bottle water has left my life. I do not use, I've got it for emergencies yes. if there's a hurricane, but I do not carry any plastic bottle water anymore. And it was amazing how quick that transition happened once we started researching microplastics. I, I was probably holding a bottle of water when we came across the research for bottles of water that have plastic and you just put it down and uh, it, it takes time. There are adjustments you have to make, but it's in your it's in your best interests. And there is another product that a close friend of mine got. She wanted a pitcher like a Brita and you know those mm -hmm. kind. Well, this one's called Clearly Filtered. and. I did some research and I found out this one actually does filter out microplastics. Believe me, not all of them do. 
obviously, if that's what you're using and you're happy with it, it's better than nothing. You're yes. not getting chlorine and chemicals and a number of things. And this is clearly filtered water pitcher. And we'll also have a little thing there. You can check on it at the bottom of the screen. And when the manufacturer, uh, when you should change the filter, please do. Yes. Please do. I, I have been to more people's houses where you pull that filter out and immediately regret drinking the water. Uh, yeah. Real it can simple only do solution. So much. Yes. If you uh, have, I have one of the old fashioned calendars in my kitchen and I write everything yep. on it. That I tried doing the phone. It didn't work for me. I'm too old school. But you look at that date and it says change filter. I know what that means. I yell at Siri to remind me in six months. And uh, then she beeps <laughs> and I don't know why she's reminding me of something. But these are just a few of the things. And we will be doing an on. This will be an ongoing series of microplastics because in the years to come, the effects of microplastics, I think, will be one, if not the biggest story about our environment, of what we can do right now for our health. Yeah, the planet may be warming, but right now you need to take care of your body, your family, your children. Because remember, you're very eating a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Wow. Just and that's food, not a water. low interest rate either. Oh, you're paying a high interest yes. rate on that one. <laughs> you really are. Well, thanks for being with us. I hope this is helpful. Let us know. Please subscribe to our channel and tell all your friends and healthcare workers about what's going on. Thank you for being with us. Welcome to Hacking the Truth. I'm your host, James Trinkle Clements. For centuries, humanity has pondered the question of does Bigfoot exist? Sightings are reported all over the globe, but is this elusive creature fact or fiction? Like you, I want to know. So I started my search at the Bigfoot Expedition Experience in Blue Ridge, Georgia. As you enter, a sign reads, you may enter a non-believer, but you will leave a believer Will you? Let's go hacking the truth. I'm here with David Becerra, and David, we came to Expedition Bigfoot. I say we. Uh, Susan's with me today, and we found it so fascinating last year. And I said I've got to find out who owns this because number one, I'm a believer, but whoever put this together, I want to know where they got the information, where they got the artifacts, how they became interested. So I'll kind of turn that over to you and if you'd just give us a background. Sure, so um, I grew up in South Florida back in the 60s and 70s. And um, ever since I was growing up, I'd heard about Tales of the Skunk Ape on the TV, on newscasts and the newspaper. I'd seen great documentaries produced in the early 70s. So as my young mind was, was strongly uh, impressed upon the seriousness of these unusual apes being spotted you know, in Florida. So it was never a laughing matter to me. And uh, then I went to go see The Legend of Boggy Creek, probably the cult oh, yeah. classic. That is uh, a classic. Yep. And of course, it's the tagline is, is a true story. And uh, the more I learn about the movie, in fact, everything in that movie did happen. Um, and more, much, much yes. more. And, uh, and so I was hooked after I saw that movie. And we moved up here about five years ago, maybe six years ago. So we're in, we're right between Blue Ridge, Georgia and LJ, Georgia in a little town called Cherry Log. We're right on the main highway, 515. It's also uh, Zell Miller Highway. But uh, our mailing address is Blue Ridge, Georgia. So we're right on the main highway. And um, we noticed that um, I was back in the restaurant business, but I've been an investigator, part-time investigator with the Bigfoot Field Research Organization since 2010. But I've been reading and researching this since I was 12. Wow. And uh, we just noticed there was a real 
lack of family entertainment up here. It's something that was suitable for grandma, grandpa, their kids, and their grandkids to all come together. Um, so we kind of we just thought about making a family attraction from all we knew about Bigfoot. Of course, all my friends are Bigfoot researchers or witnesses, so there was no shortage of artifacts. I had quite a few already, but not enough to fill the museum. So once I put the word out that I was opening up a museum, I got all kinds of calls and artifacts and foot, foot casts and videos, and I got a lot of uh, got a lot of donations to the museums because I, we do have lots of footprints here. But I try not to make up such a big deal about them, yeah. other than the Georgia footprint, which was authenticated by the FBI fingerprint expert, because there's so much more than just the footprints. Yeah. So we have the world's largest collection on permanent display here. But there, um, there's so much more. We have hair samples and videos of, of a gentleman talking about their uh, encounters with Bigfoots while they were hunting and Yeti exhibits. So I knew that when you open up this place, we, my wife and I are huge Disney World and Universal Studio yeah. fans, and, and we appreciate the kind of effort it takes to capture kids' attention. And uh, so we kind of mixed the theme park with the museum because you can't just put a bunch of posters on the wall uh, and think you're going to entertain kids. There has to be sound and movement and uh, you know more to stimulate the brain. So uh, that's how we kind of mixed it all together. So what are the hot spots? You mentioned Florida's number yeah. three. Yep. So the hot spots of Florida would be uh, the panhandle of Florida. Uh, anywhere around Tallahassee area, not in Tallahassee, but around. Apalachicola a lot. I should start looking. Yeah, oh, there's plenty of sightings up there. Okay. Uh, I have a guy that comes here actually. He's he, he knows where a family of them live at, near just outside Apalachicola, and um, the TV crews try to get his information. I told him to keep his mouth shut. You don't need to drag a. They'll ruin it for you. Oh, they will. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Ocala area. Oh my God, there's so many great stories there. So if anybody was ever going to look for a big National Forest, yeah, all no there. Yeah. I used to camp there. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of great stories there, and uh, Collier County, yeah, uh, near the Everglades. I would say that those would be the top oh, three sense. places. To, yeah. So California and Washington are the two oh, okay. highest uh, reported sightings. Then is Florida, um, Oregon, and then. Uh, Ohio round up the top five, um, and, and I, I think a lot of it's just too that the more people cite, report them in a certain state, the more people feel free to report their sightings. So I think a lot of it has to do with with uh, uh, human behavior. You know, nobody wants to be the first volunteer, but when somebody else raises their hand or two or three, then all of a sudden, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go, do I'll do it, I'll do it. So yeah. um, I think that's got a lot to do with it. But in fact, they're in every state. Uh, Nebraska, I think, only has like nine or 12 sightings. For, uh, I think I'm sure they've been spotted more than that, but there's a certain swath in the central United States where there aren't too many sightings, where there isn't a lot of water, um, or it's not real mountainous. There's not so many sightings, but they're still sighted there, but just not as much. What do you think, if you were going to say one or two things you have here is the most compelling evidence that Bigfoot exists? Uh, for, to me, it's always still going to be witness interviews. Okay. Uh, and from the eyewitnesses, because you get to a certain age when you can tell when somebody's when somebody's being dishonest or deceit, and you don't you don't pick it up on an email or a, in a book. Um, but when the person standing in front of you, you can look them dead in the eyes. Um, to me, that's one of the best. It is still the best lie detector. And that's why we have Mike Woolley in here, uh, the recording of him talking about his encounter with two Bigfoots while he was hunting in Louisiana back in the mid-80s. Um, so that, that's probably one of my favorite things because people watch that and they can just tell that this guy is, no, there's no reason for him to be lying. So that's still one of my favorite ones. Uh, probably the life-size display of the Ape Canyon incident also. You know, we hear the story about the uh, f f uh, five guys who were descended upon by a group of Sasquatches in 1924, but that's the biggest display we have here is the inside of the cabin with the Bigfoots busting in. Um, so I think that instills, in the, and you can hear the sounds on the headphones of what it would be like to be inside the cabin when that was happening. Um, now, uh, you have to keep in mind, people do send us recordings of strange things yes. uh, that recorded. And a lot of times it could be uh, an owl, uh, sometimes, and panthers make terrible screaming sounds in the woods. Vixens, uh, foxes, they make terrifying 
screeching sounds in the woods as well. But usually when you hear that, when you're a seasoned outdoorsman, you can tell it's coming from a small animal. Even if it's loud, you can tell, you can tell it's coming from a small set of lungs. Um, but these, these things, uh, I've never heard them, but I've talked to people that have heard them make sounds in the woods. And they say it's so loud, it's so powerful, it vibrates your whole body. Uh, you know it's coming from a gigantic animal. So, and, and they don't all make the same sounds. Uh, sometimes it's whooping, sometimes it's whistling, it's clicking, it sounds like wood knocks, sounds like two rocks getting clanked together. Sometimes it's a, it's a grunt, sometimes it's a, a very deep, low guttural growl that vibrates your whole body. And then there's probably seven or eight different kinds of screams they make. So yeah, they they have a way of making themselves known. And I think a lot of times they'll they'll use that to get rid of you without having to show themselves to you. Uh, a lot of rocks being thrown, branches, acorns at you. They creep you out. Uh, they make you move like you're, you're fishing and then he wants to get in that area. They'll throw rocks at, in the water in front of you and make you move out because they know how to get rid of you without actually showing themselves. They want to make you leave. But they don't want you to leave and come back with friends. They just want you to leave. So that's uh, they use little things like that to make you move on, but you probably won't come back. So they're very much like humans in the fact that 95% um, of the humans you meet are not going to hurt you. Yeah. Um, some are very friendly, and just like these things, some have a, like a real affection for us. They help us when we're lost. They save children in the woods. Um, I've talked to, there's a lawyer in Ohio that actually came out after he retired from the bar that said a big female had rescued him when he was lost in the woods and actually brought him back to camp. He was so worried about him wandering off and put a big log on him to hold him. He was a little toddler to hold him down so, until his parents come back to the campsite. But unfortunately, like humans, there are some bad elements in there. And uh, you can just imagine what an eight-foot animal that uh, that's faster than, a, you know, they could run 35, 40, 45, 50 miles an hour, and it's like stealthy in the wood. You can imagine what kind of damage something, oh. just one of those could do, let alone a hundred of them. Yeah. So um, we tend to, we tend to want to make, is it, is it good or bad? When yeah. in fact, most of them, it's, it's different shades of good and bad. But, uh, the large majority of these things really don't want anything to do with us. Uh, and uh, most of them will just walk away. They actually get disgusted with themselves when they, when they realize when a, a human has seen them. But uh, I'd be a liar if I said that there's a, not a tiny percentage of them that do not like us. Is there any estimates of how many what the population could be? Is there any feeling about that? So the bear biologists have, uh, have come forward to say that there are anywhere between on the to have a viable breeding population a minimum of 3,500 up to 10,000 in North America okay so how accurate that number is I don't know but it sounds like a pretty good number to me so uh, when you try to tell people that there's giant families of giants wandering the woods who wants to think that especially hunters that feel at ease in the woods do they want to think that there's yeah. a 10 foot giant up there they can reach and snatch them right out of a tree stand if they so choose to? And it's too disturbing, it's too frightening. For every hunter that's come in here to, to tell me that uh, there's no way these things are real because I've been in the woods my whole life, I've met two guys that have told me that they've had one walk up under their stand, walk up to their stand, walk past them when they were hunting. So for every one that tells me that they that they can't be real, I've got two hunters that tell me that they are because they've watched them. I do remember when we were here last year, and I'm not sure if it was a video or a tape, but of the military, the helicopter had crashed mm -hmm. and they went into the woods. I don't know exactly where it was. Mm -hmm. Where was that? So that was just north of um, of. Uh, what is just north of um, there's so many towns here in Georgia not to oh was it, it, was it in Georgia oh it's in Georgia it's okay. only about okay. 40 miles from here and there's a plaque up there from where the helicopter crashed Dawsonville so it's just north of oh, Dawsonville. Dawsonville yeah and uh, it's actually difficult to find I've actually tried to find somebody to take me out there and show me the plaque where it happened but the actual crash in it itself didn't have anything to do with Bigfoot it's the smell of the burning bodies actually brought three Bigfoots in. 
So that story was submitted to the BFRO back in the mid 2000s. And um, since then, somebody came out and said, I've read that and it's not true. But then I've had two people come in here whose husbands that live in Georgia, whose husbands were at the uh, crash site. At, at, well, no, they weren't at the crash site. They were at the base okay. when the guys came back to the crash site and they were talking about it and they were all told to shut up, stop talking about it. So that's why I included it because in my mind, it has not been debunked. Uh, not when two people come in here, two wives uh, have told me that they, their husbands were there and they told them about it. So basically, the helicopter crash, they sent in, I don't know, three or four individual mm -hmm. military men to go find, see if there were any survivors. Right. When they got there, they saw the Bigfoot yep. family, I think. There at the crash site, going through, they had smelled the bodies, right. dragging some stuff off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were bodies or parts mm -hmm. or. They were pulling the bodies out. Yeah. They were pulling the bodies out. Yeah. And they opened fire on them, and then they yeah. stayed up all night after they, after the creatures had run into the forest in the darkness. They had built the fire up really high and stayed up all night, until the, uh, the extraction team came in to remove the bodies the next day. Wow. I think I think they've always been here. Um, um, I, I, I'm in contact with. Uh, and I follow a lot of research in Australia, and there's this continent that sheared off um, Asia, what, 250 million years ago? Oh, I didn't know Australia. Yeah, Australia, they have the Yowie there, and oh, uh, so okay. lots of great reports are there. Uh, and they've, you know, they've, uh, even though the continent is largely undeveloped, uh, the, I think the oldest living skeletons ever found. I think they just found a couple that were one or two that were 50,000 years old. But most of them are only 2,000 years old. So okay. humankind is relatively new to Australia. So, I mean, how did these things get there? How did these giant humans get there? Families of them. They've been spotted all over Australia. So the land bridge thing only gets you so far. Um, um, so... Yeah, I don't, I don't know how they got here. I, I have my theories. But. So when the first teeth, so Gigantopithecus, yeah, the, giant, the teeth and the some jaw fragments were discovered, had been discovered in caves in the China, Vietnam, and I think Russia as well. And um, we, we've only got enough to put together a small portion of a jaw and then a few hundred teeth, fossilized teeth. And when you look at the, when you look at the image, that the uh, scientists have put forth of Gigantopithecus, what you have is a giant ape. Because when they found the teeth, they said, well, this must be some sort of giant ape. So what, you, what you're looking at is a quadruped ape, but in fact, scientists have no idea what it looked like. So we've already got, where I have the impression that this, these teeth belong to a giant ape, when they, it's just as likely that they belong to a giant, upright, 10-foot, hairy ape man. So, um, um, so it's possible that these things already exist in our fossil record, but for some reason, yeah, we're not supposed to know about them. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that every native, every single Native American tribe had their own name for these creatures. Yeah, and, and it's it's hard to it's hard to imagine that they were all had their own imaginary giant wild man in the woods. And when you go back to read the newspapers and then. 1800s, early 1900s, there's just hundreds of newspaper reports of people spotting these things, um, taking cows and chickens. And this is well before the 1950s, um, when the, the, discovered, the Jerry Crews discovered the first footprints, photographed them, and the name Bigfoot was coined by a newspaper man. Well, well the reports of these things go way, way before that. In fact, these things were seen way back, I think the first... Uh, Endangered Species Act was enacted back in 1960, but our, the, the National Forest Service, I don't think was the, was actually, I'm trying to remember the date it was, but the, the sightings and the suppression of these things started way back before the Serv Forest Service yeah. was ever established. So whatever the secret behind these things are predates our government and, and uh, the Forest Service. So for whatever reason that there, we're not allowed to know about these, in my opinion, doesn't have a whole lot to do with the forest. Uh, the thing of, is something else. In reality, when people come in here and they, and, uh, and they tell me that they saw Bigfoot, but their father or mother don't believe them or their wife doesn't believe them, it's really a microcosm of the human mind. Is that when you introduce very disturbing information to somebody and it, it conflicts with their belief system, they're going to automatically reject it. 
and it has no direct uh, that, that doesn't doesn't mean that you're not a good person they don't believe you but you're giving them information they don't want I've been a private investigator also for 31 years mm -hmm. they're facts and they're just too many facts and too many things that are said in a court of law someone could be convicted of murder with all the evidence you have right so to speak and all the evidence we have of so many different people, so many different walks of life, so many sightings. If it's not that, then I would say to someone, well, then what is it? Mm -hmm. Give me another explanation. Sure. All these people aren't hallucinating when they're out there. Right. So. Yeah, we're fortunate enough we get a lot of military, retired and current military, and we get a lot of law enforcement in here that yes. have told some other sightings. And it's, this, it's the same thing. I already know that they're not going to go, you know, I don't get their address and their badge number. I, I, I know they have a they have a, a reputation to uh, protect. So well, we take the sightings, we take the story, and I don't blame them for uh, not wanting to come forth. But when people ask that question, like you just said, you know, how come they don't come forward and say that UFOs are real? Well, they haven't they haven't done enough research to realize that uh, the reason that they're never going to disclose UFOs or Bigfoots is not because of the subject matter, but what's behind that subject matter, what is operating behind the scenes. Uh, so if, if, if the uh, authorities admitted that these th creatures were real or that UFOs were real, then we, we, we'll may take the next step and want to know what's behind it, and that's what's the secret. I had, I had a, uh, a, a nice guy, he uh, gave me this um, great comparison, he says, when people keep asking, why didn't you get it on film? He said, it's like trying to film your own car accident. Is that when you see this thing, thing unfolding in front of you, you're in sheer panic mode. You are not thinking about grabbing your phone to film it. It's a proof to everybody. You're not worried about if anybody believes you. You're just trying to live through the moment. Yes. And uh, you're just overcome with fear, stress, and you can have a camera in your hand and still not take a picture of it. Yeah. Some of my best friends, Lori Wade, she organizes all the expeditions in the North Georgia area for the Bigfoot Field Research Organization. Oh, okay. So there's, I know there's a two in October up here, and that's just with the BFRO. There's there's other private expeditions that go on. I've been on many uh, organized expeditions with the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, and I've been on way more private expeditions. My, myself, my wife, and a couple of friends, or just me and my wife, will go out and put camera traps out along creek beds uh, where I know there's crawfish and food. Uh, sometimes we'll go out to, uh, to the tops of mountains where people record screaming and we'll hang recorders up there that'll hang for a month or two. They just turn on at certain times of the night and shut back off, battery backups. So, But, but the, the days of my expeditions are, I'll still go on a few, Yeah. but the good, the stuff I'm looking for just walks in the door here. Um, I know they're real. I know they cross roads. I know they hide behind trees. I've seen two in Alva, Florida. So my continued um, experience or my continued uh, expeditions are, just don't make a lot of sense to me because you're, you only get to a point where you're like a really good camper because not a whole lot normally happens on expeditions. But when people can come in here and tell me that one crawled through their window yeah, one was looking at them when they were a child. They saw one up on the roof of their house. It was stomping around. It banged down. So the, like, I get so much good information that just walk. It's, it behooves me yeah. in my studies to be here to take information than it does to be out there banging on trees, hoping that I hear or see something. Yeah. A lot of people uh, that, that trade or gift these creatures, these creatures will gift things back to them. So what you have in these display cases, what you might find left in place of your food. If you have so the creature will actually, if the people will leave food out, yeah, and then they will leave something for them for a gift, right? Wow. Yeah, that's why we know it's a sentient thinking being, is because um, once they like you, and they take your food, they'll start leaving you things. Sometimes it's a something you lost two years ago. Sometimes it's a shiny piece of metal that to them has some kind of value, and they'll give that to you. Uh, and of course, anytime people want to leave food for them, we always tell them to not leave them like an entire meal. You just want to leave them a treat. And it seems like sweet bread products are the treat they really enjoy. Cinnamon buns, 
peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, so anything sweet, basic bread, is one of those things that they enjoy. I may be a Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah. right. My, that's one of my <laughs> like weaknesses. My but it's something butter. they can get in the wild. David, thank you so much. You're welcome, my friend. I mean, I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, thanks. And I wanted to meet the man behind. Well, welcome back to the Morning Omelet. I'm James Trinkle Clements. And I'm Justin Bobbitt. And we have some stuff to throw in the omelet. We got a Quite a of, bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. Some hot stuff, some yeah. interesting stuff. And uh, I would like to lead off with a really neat story. Uh, and it's about, and it's from Epic Times, and I'll talk about the newspaper later. But it's Go Forth and Kick Butt. Navy's first black female fighter pilot graduate, and she's going to get her wings. So we're going to put a picture of that up. Uh, I hope she knows we do this because I want to go for a ride in a jet. Seriously. That's one on my, my bucket list. She couldn't have looked any happier in yes. those photos. And uh, she's Madeline Swiegel, and she is assigned to the Red Hawks Training Squadron VT-21 at Kingsville, Tennessee, Naval Air Station. Congratulations. What an accomplishment. Congratulations. That is huge. Yeah. I'm telling you. Well, to, to make you laugh, since we're all such indoors. Yeah. Um, I found some, some amazing pieces that I just have to show you guys. Uh, so the first uh, painting that's on the screen is the Eke Homo, E-C-C-E Homo. It's in Borgia, Spain. You can clearly see it's a painting of Jesus. Uh, mm. They wanted to yeah. um, nice. restore it. And uh, they, in 2012, gave it to a senior that was untrained, just a normal conservationist, but untrained in actual painting conservation. Uh, so you can see here what they've done. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Will um, not be on Antiques Roadshow. No, show. no. no it Funny will not enough, be. they are saying that her messing this painting up uh, fixed the tourism in the city because it no did. one was showing up, and now they have this amazing painting. That so now they've got to come and see how bad it is. They're selling bad painting coffee mugs, mouse pads, t shirts. I want one. Yes, yes. <laughs> it is amazing. <laughs> And then again, and painting coffee. again in Spain, uh, Navarre, Spain, uh, this is the statue of St. George. Uh, really nice, clean piece, but you could see it just had some aging issues. Sure. Um, so they had a local art teacher. That's who I would get. Try to sure. fix it. Uh, she didn't clean it. She just painted over it. And this is the Disney appearance. That's what most people say. It looks like a Disney character. Uh, but this painting you're seeing now is the... Uh, the conservation effort. Oh, um, look at that. Isn't that um, <laughs> interesting? Yeah. I've got to ask, when you're doing this, don't you know that it's not going to be well received? You're you. cartooning something. And, uh, okay. So I'll uh, also put no. up a picture of the, um, <laughs> I'm sure you remember the story of the statue that was made for the soccer player. Uh, it was a bronze bust. Uh, and, and I'll have that on the screen. It uh, was universally panned as one of the worst statues that's ever been commissioned. And there um, have been some paintings, too, of politicians. And I can't remember them at, at the, this moment. But yeah. You just got to laugh. Oh, it looks they're no, great. Looks nothing like the person. They are great. Yeah. Um, talking about the quarantine, uh, speaking with a friend of mine who has three children at home mm. and... I said, well, are you thinking about, have you thought about divorce? He said, uh, divorce, no, murder, yes. 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 <laughs> you know, that was one the, of the. The Benadryl smoothie uh, first thing in the yeah. morning. Just, just tough. Uh, boy, we got to get back out. And yeah. 
and they're shutting down. We're in Florida, by the way, so they're shutting us, not shutting us down, but they're they're masking us, which I will rob a bank because they are they going to catch me. Yeah. So. But there's no money in a bank anymore. Yeah. Just- nope. Well, since we all are stuck inside, I did find I've been ordering masks on Amazon, as I'm sure a lot of other people are. Not sure. the N95 crazy masks, but no. just the normal fabric masks. Uh, so I found these mask templates. I'm going to put those in the description. If Since you're stuck at home doing nothing, uh, that might be able to help you out a bit, make some masks, uh, save yourself some money. And also last night I figured out that the Food Network Kitchen app, if you have a Fire TV or a Fire tablet, is 100% free for the first year. It's normally about 40 bucks, 39.95. Uh, but if you have a Fire TV or a Fire tablet, totally free. They have not only a ton of great cooking shows, but they've broken down all the recipes uh, into different categories. So you can figure out what you want to make. It has step-by-step, totally free for the first year. Uh, definitely, if you're trying to cook while you're in quarantine, this might be a way to up your cooking game just a little bit. Now, on the video, you mentioned to me it shows step by step. Mm-hmm. So, okay, you, and then you can stop it or yeah, and they say, have okay, it. I'll get it done. And then you go, it I shows, really like yeah. that because I'll see some things I love to cook. Mm-hmm. And there's this recipe and it's broken down into four segments and you start reading it. And you just say, I'm not yeah. doing this. I, now, if someone was saying, hey, it's not that hard. No. Just do this. You know. They have video that shows you what to do, and then you just click next step, and it'll go to the next step, and that's for their their specific recipes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, I um, need that. Yeah. I'm very simple-minded, you may have guessed, but I'm just get, you know, I'm like a dog. I have one track mind. I'm not a multitasker at all. So just do that for me. <laughs> uh, I like to find neat things. And you did turn me on to the iPod or whatever. Yes, the wireless, the AirBuds or Air, AirPods, Air, AirPods, AirPods, sorry. the original white ones anyway that I got. Well, I had a problem with those because they, yeah, they hang in your ear, but at the gym I kept knocking them out. So you turned me on to the Samsung uh, Galaxy. Galaxy Buds, they're great. Galaxy Buds, they are great, yeah. by the way. They're $150. But I started, well, I do watch television, and as seen on television, and they're making all these claims about these earbuds. Then I look, do my research, and not so good what they're claiming. Then I said, well, let me see, you know, what you can find. So I go to CNET, and I read the reviews and read a couple other reviews, and this one product kept popping up. So I said, why not? Let me try it. Because when I go to the gym and get on the elliptical, you know, you'll brush your hair and then there yeah, goes the, wanna, and then it goes out. Yeah. I don't want to lose the hundred and fifty dollar ones. Or go to the lake or do whatever you're doing. Go to the beach and get sand in. I them. left mine on a Spirit Airlines flight. Oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. That's Lucky a, person that sat in that seat after me. Oh. Huh? So this is called Ear Fun. And so they said this is really highly rated. So I got them. Sure. Wireless charging case. Oh, yeah, wireless. Yeah. Wireless. Well, it keeps closing. Wireless charging case. You can see the size of them. They fit very comfortably in your ears. Now, if you're a real audiophile, it is not the greatest sound like these are at $150. But I would give it a probably 7.8 8.2 on a scale of 10 if, you know, different uh, people have different perceptions yeah. about, you know, what good sound is. But absolutely, music's fine. But if you really want, you know, listen to Chopin or yeah. something, you may want these. But I listen to podcasts. They're great. $49. They had a $5 coupon. I don't know if that's still good, but we're going to put a link I'll at put the a link. bottom. Yeah, make sure but it's we'll, easy to find. Let me tell you, for I don't think you can beat this for forty nine dollars, no. and I don't want to lose them. But if I lose one and they're non functional, it's not one hundred and fifty bucks a shot. If you're in the gym, if you're working in the yard, yeah, and you're sweating, yeah, I know these are supposed to be water resistant. Yeah, sometimes I just don't. In Florida, you don't sweat; Ugh. you bathe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So gross. So we'll leave a link to this. Highly recommend it. And if you get them, please let us know what you think. Appreciate that. I think you'll like these. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Hey, you there. Yes, you. Are you bored in COVID quarantine? Feel like you've seen everything on Netflix? 
Remember when you wished every day was like the weekend? Want to skip the next six months and try again in January? Try new prescription strength comatine. Our patented formula puts you into a coma fast and keeps you time traveling until the desired wake date. All you have to do is take two and say goodbye to this month and hello to next spring. If quarantine is getting old, ask your doctor about comatine today. Side effects include missed birthdays, weddings, job termination, weight loss, color tasting, and divorce. Use directed. Comatine is not responsible for lost or missing children. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting perspective and a different way to look at things. Something normal, something good to do. I would like to pass along a little hint. If you love entertainment, go to YouTube and look up Sammy Davis Jr., his concert in Australia. Ooh, that sounds good. I think he was the greatest entertainer of all time, period. My favorite. It's about an hour long. I will guarantee you will be mesmerized. I've never seen anything like it. So especially for you people who really don't know of the Rat Pack, and this was in the early 60s when they kicked this off at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. But Sammy Davis Jr. went all over the world. But this particular performance is astounding. So give it a shot when you're, as you're locked in. Yeah, let's wondering be honest, what you have do. time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can binge watch a lot of stuff, yeah. which I am. And by the way, uh, Beecham House, a new series on PBS, what a fantastic, fantastic piece they're doing. It's about India in the 1700s, so if you get a chance, check that out. Well, that sounds really interesting. I've been trying to work through the Twilight Zone. Still haven't all the new Twilight Zone. Oh, um, you did put some there for me. I've got the look yes, at those. Yes, yes, the old ones are so amazing. But i really got to say, the new, they've done justice. Uh, I've, I've been really I'm, enjoyed I'm what I've seen. I'm very impressed. Yeah. And I'm a Twilight Zone junkie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we all know who Einstein was. And uh, he was asked a question one time, and here's what... Einstein answered. He said, when you were courting a nice girl, an hour seems like a second. When you sit on a hot coal, a second seems like an hour. That's relativity. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good way to explain it. How many times do you think people ask Einstein, please explain yeah. the theory of relativity? Gave it, um, gave it to him straight. He gave it to him straight. If you've been watching the morning omelet, you know by now that my favorite newspaper is called the Epic Times. Uh, i show you this right here. And you can also go to epictimes.com and, and get some free issues. So check that out. But they did a story um, in the Life and Tradition section. And this young man is T.K. Coleman. And he has a podcast, which I highly recommend. It's called Revolution of One. And here's a picture of him. And he talks about empowering young men, leading them in the right direction. And he's doing what I have thought for so long, talk about being an entrepreneur. So many kids are forced into school put in a cubby hole and say, you need to do this or graduate from, and they have no interest in yeah. it whatsoever. But he talks about, and his guests are tremendous too. So give the podcast a listen. He goes to schools all over the United States. I would like to see him come to here in Jacksonville. Uh, what a great young man and what he's doing. His wife's a teacher also. But he explains and talks about things we the direction education should go in because the education that we have mandated from the turn of the century, quite frankly, doesn't fit now. That one size fits all across no, the United no, States. And I was so bored in school. Oh, yeah. I got in more trouble because I was just bored and it wasn't challenged. I didn't, this, the classes I liked. I excelled in. The other ones I didn't pay yeah. a bit of attention to. Uh, we have got to change the educational system. Number one, we've got to get the federal government out of it and let 
each district determine the best way to go. That's just my soapbox for the day. But please, the Epic Times, check this out. And we'll put a link down to his podcast in the description. So you don't have to hunt. Just head down to the description yeah. and you can hop right over. So if you can shake up the establishment a little bit, and I like to do that. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll have another morning omelet coming your way soon. I'm James Trickle Clements. I'm Justin Bobbitt. You have a nice day. the truth. We will challenge you to question your beliefs while exploring the hidden agenda behind today's headlines. Hacking the truth will bring untold secrets into the light and reveal truths never told before while exposing those hiding in plain sight. And now, you're your host, James Circle Clement and Bob Wallace. Well, I'm here with Bob Wallace. How are you this morning, Bob? I'm doing great, Jim. And uh, even though we can't see you, we know you're in the ethers, and that's a good thing. Yeah, it seems like we used to do stuff together. Then we watched each other on screens, and now we can't do it. We can't see anything. Yeah, well, we'll get back to it soon. I guarantee it. Well, we talked about a number of things, uh, and you mentioned what will life be like 20, 40 years from now in the from what it seems to be from where we've come in the last 50 to 60 years, it's been such drastic changes. But let's talk about what the future was thought it would be like when we were growing up or when we were coming of age in, just say, the 60s. I remember, you know, we were going to be flying around and on personal planes. There would be no cars. There would be no pollution. We'd have all this wonderful technology we'd have robots we wouldn't know what to do with all our leisure time and we saw all these magnificent things like the Tomorrowland at disney how has that worked out for us well i think we've done pretty well on the technology front uh the flying vehicle thing i think is still a ways off uh even the uh, i was surprised but it made sense when it was explained to me we will soon have trains and planes and boats that are just done by remote control. But it's going to be a long time before we have sort of self-driving cars because of the complexity of driving. So maybe we should be a little more sympathetic to those among us that have difficulty driving because it really is hard to do. You have to keep track of all kinds of things at the same time. Well, the technology in so many areas definitely has improved tremendously. I mean, what we're doing right now, doing a television show, and we used to do one in a studio, was very complicated as far as equipment. Now you can go on Amazon and buy yourself a studio for $1,000. And one thing I've been watching, and that is how many changes are made in technology that improve products, and actually there's no notice of that given. There's no big uh, advertising campaigns, nothing to show that it's been done, but those products are slowly getting better and better around us. It really is probably our proudest product of the last 50 years. And, you know, one of the things I looked at when we were talking about doing uh, forecasts of what would happen is just how do you do that? And there's really two ways and one is to take what's ever happening now and project it into the future and probably the safest one to do that with is technology i think you're right and because if you deal with climate if you deal with society that is a very finite moving target it's hard to hit it's hard to put a laser beam on it because one thing like we've seen recently covid can change the, everything, and it becomes so much more complex as far as society goes. Well, the only thing I can say is, God forbid what would happen if we had a, another, uh, I can't remember right now, the really fatal, highly fatal 
disease that they had in the Middle Ages. Oh, uh, okay, the Black Plague. Yeah, the bubonic Black plague. plague. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Were there like forty or fifty percent death rates? I mean, I think the whole world would fall would collapse if that happened. Maybe we're lucky that it happened with something that is dangerous enough to make us take notice and not so dangerous that we don't have a chance to learn about it and prepare for the next one. So that would be a question I'd have for you is, are we going to finally learn from history and learn to protect ourselves better and have better resources to deal with something that's much more serious than this present one, as serious as it is? Um, I think to a degree we will overall. I don't give us much hope. And the reason I say that, I've seen human nature deteriorate to a point of madness in the last two or three months. Not only with Black Lives Matter, but the minute we could get back outside from COVID, people were gathering without mask in mass and just Say la vie, throw it to the wind, who cares? And so it wouldn't have made any difference if we would have stayed in another two months and gone back out. I think human nature is human nature. We're going to do what we want to do. And if anyone tells us what to do, we don't like it. Now, we can argue uh, back and forth or the results of wearing masks, not wearing masks, what we should do. But I look at it more as how the population responds to certain stimulus. And so uh, I don't give us much hope as a whole because I don't think we are growing more intelligent. I think we're growing less intelligent as a population. You know, in that area, I think we're disproving evolution, don't you think? Yes, I do. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked before about that uh, the notion that uh, what we learn from history is that we don't learn from history, right? And what you're, what's really saying is human nature does not change. Uh, we tend to discredit what happened before. Uh, we say things like, well, it, it, it really was just a one-time event or uh, you know, we, can handle, we can handle the emergency now. We don't need to worry about it. All sorts of... Uh, basically lies to ourselves that things are different now. Well, let's look at something current. We've always said we'll never get into another Vietnam. Well, we are. And we've been there for, what, 20 years? Yeah. I mean, we just, I mean there's no doubt. You cannot defeat an ideology. So you send these men and women over, and they just get mutilated and come back broken emotionally, physically, what have we accomplished? Nothing. So we didn't learn, did we? Yeah, and the campaign to win the hearts and minds of the people in the Mideast and have a, dem remember, what wasn't it called, the Democratic Spring? Yes. That was going to happen. And I haven't heard about it recently in the news, but I would imagine it was an abject failure on all fronts. Well, I remember... You remember we talked Go ahead. Uh, back when Viet Vietnam was going on and my friends were coming back and they would say, what are we doing? We keep taking the same hill. They bring us back. They ask us to go back. And one of my friends said in talking to the locals that were on the communist side, he says, why do you f follow the communists in the north? Why do you do that? And the family said, we will follow whoever will feed us. It's survival. We forget that. Well, it certainly always, we don't understand ourselves, and we certainly don't understand the cultures and the point of views of, of other people. And actually, uh, one of my uh, current trends that I thought would continue is just this, that the cyclical pattern of history repeating will continue to happen because we lack the awareness to learn from history. Well, I, I mentioned a quote from Aristotle uh, to you the other day, and it is, tolerance and apathy 
are the last virtues of a dying society. Boy, are we witnessing that right now? Yeah, I mean, actually, that's, you know, I after we finish the uh, current trend section, I would like to get into the cyclical nature, and that's what you're talking about. But uh, there are some very clear indicators of a decline of a country or decline of an empire. And, and one of the greatest ones is the loss of virtue. Our virtues change from positive ones to really negative ones. And what's being championed now as the best virtue of all, which is tolerance of everything, except for the people we don't like, uh, is very much uh, in you know, the, head, the head virtue of today. And i like to lead into that with uh, an article from Epic Times, and that's a uh, newspaper we get once a week, which I, I highly recommend. It's spelled E-P-O-C-H. Please uh, go to the website, take a look at it. One of the best newspapers, and I used to be in the newspaper business that I have seen, uh, but it's by Alex Newman, and it's the rise of the federal education system accelerated the demise of real education. I think if most Americans could read this article, they would have a greater understanding of what they've said about the dumbing down of America. And that was a book by the uh, head of education in Ronald Reagan's cabinet of how socialism and Mar or Marxism, whatever you want to call it, has got into our educational system, and we have definitely dumbed down America. He does a very good job of explaining how the federal government took over the education of children from their parents, their local community, uh, and their and their state, uh, and it's not a novel story. Uh, the federal government has done this repeatedly throughout our country, and yet I'd be willing to bet that 99% of people have no idea that the federal government does go through this process of taking control. And their primary way of doing it, which is mentioned in this article, is they offer you money. They offer to help you. And before you know it, you're addicted to that money, and you – start doing whatever they say, and then after a while it gets institutionalized and they're controlling the whole thing. And that's what the Department of Education does. You remember Reagan, he tried to get rid of the thing. Even Trump said that he would try to get rid of it. And got 40,000 employees. <laughs> yeah. And I remember when I first heard about the Department of Education, I thought, what do we need that for? I mean, don't, people, don't we already know what kids need to learn? Do we need some bureaucrats in Washington to tell us what we already know? No, we need to send but, the politicians back to school. That's why we need it. Well, as you read the article, you realize that the school curriculum was not really the issue. I mean, here I was naively thinking that they really wanted to educate the children so that they could be independent thinking citizens that could make decisions on their own and analyze information. And it turned out I was completely wrong about the whole process. And if people read that article in the Epic Times, uh, and it's a good read. It doesn't take you, what, 10 minutes to read the article. Uh, it's certainly worth reading. And one of the villains in the whole thing, one of my favorite villains, which is Billy Carter, president of the United States. Jimmy Carter. Billy was his drunken oh. brother. <laughs> <laughs> You've had too much Billy you Carter know, beer. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the problem. You're correct. Of course, it was Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Maybe Billy would have done a better job. I don't know. He probably would but, have. Uh, definitely, definitely Jimmy was not, was not a good president. No, no. no. Uh, yeah. Well, when we've talked about the federal government, and what they've got involved in or involved us in, and what are the results, and what are some shining examples. We usually talk about how they just destroyed the railroads, came in with Amtrak. It's never been the same since. But when you look at education, I think the most— and they even admit it by their own statistics that in the of eighth graders, and you have core subjects, and we know their English and their math and— 
science, of all the core subjects, two-thirds of eighth graders aren't proficient in even one. That's a staggering statistic. And how are they going to develop the awareness to lead our country out of very complicated matters where there's so many lies being told, uh, you know, and, and evidence given and theories given that are completely false? I wanted to mention something I saw this morning when I was uh, just looking for stuff to talk about today. There's an outfit called Campus Reform. Have you ever run across them? No. Well, they do that man on the street scenario. Oh, I've seen them. Okay. Yeah. And this one was appropriately about the 4th of July, and they went out very early in the week and started asking college kids questions. So the first, now, to be fair, I'm sure a lot of kids answer these things correctly, but some of the answers were so scary you make it want you wouldn't even think that they'd ever gone to school at all. So the the first thing they asked, which was a difficult question, is what is the fourth of July July fourth about? Uh, most of them had no idea what it was about. And they even with some hints, they had trouble remembering that in fact the fourth of July is about the Declaration of Independence that was signed on July 4th of 1776. Now, I'm not that great on dates. I can goof on the dates, and so I'll give anybody a pass on dates. But when they were asked what the year the the Declaration of Independence was signed, a disturbing proportion, no joke, said sometime in the 1970s. The 1970s. Yeah, that was when we got our freedom. And my favorite answer of all was when they were asked, what country did we get our, did the United States get its freedom from? Some of them said America. Uh, I I wish I could say I'm surprised. I'm not. Right. Because it has not been taught in school, in elementary school. I know when you and I went to school, of course, you were in a different state, but we had civics, we had government, we had Americanism versus communism. We studied these, we talked about them. It was our parents fought in the Second World War, and our grandparents, some in the First World War. So it was predominant subject of how fortunate we are to live in this country. Now I think a lot of kids growing up thinking we have a horrible country from what they see from the media. Well, the one thing they all knew was that America was a racist country. Sure. They they all knew that. That was the one thing they were sure of. Uh, The last thing, which is small, was that they asked them what the name of the war was, and the answers given among them were the French Revolution, World War II, and the Civil War. It's, I mean, I was truly laughing. I should have been crying probably, but I was laughing when I watched it. And these were not little kids. These were college kids. Well, in this article in the paper, it explains how we get to that point. Because in 1932, there was a book toward Soviet America by the Communist U.S. Party leader, William Foster. And his goal, he said was a United States Department of Education that would eventually replace patriotism and Christianity in schools with communism and globalism. That pretty much sums it up. The the thing is truly astonishing. That's not a secret doctrine that's kept behind a safe that only the few can see. It's not classified information. They actually publicized what they were going to do and then did it. Truly remarkable. Well, didn't Khrushchev say, we will bury you without a shot, without a weapon? We will destroy you from within. And I think we're seeing it today. And I don't think, now I'm a numbers guy. I love to play around with numbers and math. And I just think everything is mathematical, Bob. You have a population, you have a certain number of people in that population. 
And when it gets out of balance, just like the Hacking the Truth logo, when you have the scales there, when it gets out of balance, what does it take to correct it? Well, to go the other way. The problem we have is our population and the indoctrination of the population and the growth of the population is so far on the other side. I don't think it'll ever get balanced again because we've created welfare systems where millions of people are born into and never leave white and black. They're not educated. Uh, They've just outnumbered us, and I don't think we're going back. And I'm not a pessimist. I'm just a realist. That's my opinion. I hope I'm wrong. Well, the one thing I, you know, when you look at the different theories, the cyclical theories of what's going to happen in the future, uh, it's a little scary because there's there's any number of them, but some of the most popular ones are the uh, fourth turning theories of generations and the congratia of uh, super waves, super cycles and waves that uh, is, is based largely on economic factors. And the, uh, the other one, of course, is, is psychological. And then there's just simply the theory of empire. And all three of them very strongly point to a very dark period in our history that's coming up within the next 20 years. And what's pointed out is that it's not necessarily that we're going to fail, but we're either going to have a big failure or we're going to have a big success and a rebirth. Right now, a rebirth looks pretty slim. It's, it's uh, losing wind and it's 10, 10 yards behind the leader, but uh, still it is a possibility. It's not cooked. You never know. A new generation may arise in the next 20 years that will tip the scale back the other way. I certainly hope so. But my point is that even if we get the darkest one, you can still survive in that. Millionaires are made in the Great Depression. Businesses flourish in the Great Depression. It can be done. It's not time to give up, but it's time to certainly get your act together, practice self-discipline, learn what's going on, and do the best you can to help yourself and your family. Well, I agree with all those things. I would like to see them happening more. Maybe they are, and I'm just not aware of it. I see it in some communities and other, but I see the other communities who take more than they give. And this is what I'm talking about. If you truthfully add it up and we'll take black, white, Hispanic, whatever welfare system, illegals coming over, getting on the welfare system, how much they've taken from the system and how much they put into the system, the negative deficit is amazing. You throw in not only the money they get, but also the crimes committed, and not all, not all. Some break out of the cycle of poverty, do a great job, but there's such a high percentage in America of the people who take more than they give. When that, truthfully, is more than 50%, how are they going to be supported, and will that start the revolution? Actually, you just did a good job summarizing the empire cycle. When the empire starts to fall, the two things that you mentioned with extensive welfare was one of them, especially when it becomes an expected entitlement, like a property right. It's not something you get that can be taken away. It's yours, and no one can take it away from you. And that's very much, I believe, the way people look at it. And I think, have you noticed just recently that people are starting to talk about minimum incomes for everybody again? Oh, I have. Yeah. Take advantage of any, any calamity, any disaster and use it to push things that under normal times could never be pushed. I I think you and I have mentioned that about a thousand times over the years and they even say they're going to do that. and And people still fall for it. That's the thing that amazes me the most. All this information is right out there to say, we're going to do this. Every time there's an emergency, we're going to ram something down your throat and you're going to like it. We go, okay. Well, we've grown into generations now that they get their information. I call them flatliners because they look at flat screens all day. So the information they're taking in, they're making an immediate judgment. They're for or against it. I don't think they're open-minded at all, but... 
the frightening thing about it, they're making these judgments and they have no personal experience in this area whatsoever. Most of them are so young, they are still living at home probably with their parents or they're 25 or 35 years old. How do you think you're going to look at it when you're 50? Quite a bit different. But they don't have the experience. They'll run out into the streets. They'll do whatever they'll do. And, and it's mob rule. We used to have something that when a family member was out of line, one of our children would say, we'll give them some TL, meaning tough love. We're going to clamp down on you. You're not getting this. Now TL is Twitter lynching. You come out and speak the truth, and then they jump on, They just pile on because it's not what well, they believe in or want to believe in. Well, there's definitely been a change of values. The, which you just mentioned one of them, which is when we were kids, if something happens at school, we are automatically at fault. Nowadays, oh, yeah. it's the teacher who's automatically at fault. What did you do to make this happen? How could you let this go on? All right, it's the teacher's problem, not the child. Um, one, you brought up uh, immigration, and and when they were talking about the fall of empires, the important part about it is not the fact that there's immigration because there's always immigration. It's that they stop assimilating. They do not adopt your culture. So there's conflict between cultures. And that's the sign of the fall of empire and to civilization. My goodness, look at Europe today. It's a disaster area. And, you know, cities have no go zones. Well, what better way to say we want no part of your culture and you can't come here? So that's definitely a major sign of of decline. One of the more interesting ones was the change of heroes. Hey, Bob, before we get into heroes, I do want to mention the Epic Times. I'm holding a okay. copy right sure. here. And you can go to epictimes.com. And I think for two bucks, they'll send you three weeks, three issues. I highly recommend it. And if you do that, please mention Hacking the Truth that you saw it here. And just great not only articles on what we're talking about today, but I do think the health section, the lifestyle section, some of the best I've seen. And we were talking, or you were starting to talk about heroes. So let's talk about heroes. The most interesting thing to me is that a lot of the ways that you measure the decline and fall of a, of a country are very complex. But there's a very simple one. And that's when the people that are looked up to, who are the heroes of society and culture, they change. In the beginning, when a country is strong and growing, their heroes are soldiers, builders, pioneers, and explorers. They're the people that go out there and accomplish great things. When a society starts to fall, and I thought this was a modern phenomenon, but they have actually traced it back to Rome, it changes. It goes to celebrities, sports stars, actors, musicians, and even people who are famous for being famous. The celebrities like the Kadassians and other folks like that. And it's if you ask people on the street today or kids what who are their heroes, they're not going to name scientists or people that have done great things for the country. They're going to talk about their favorite pop stars, their favorite athletes. And unfortunately, a lot of those folks, their lifestyles are really best not uh, copied because they're pretty low level in many, in many cases. So if you really want to have a quick gauge of how a country is doing, look at its heroes because they reflect the culture and how people look at the world. Well, I believe these people become people who are admired for a number of reasons, but one of the other reasons is we get away from what truthfully problems we need to solve by watching sports, by watching movies, by escapism. And when you do this, you fill your time with that in the evening, afternoon, or all day, whatever you do. You get up the next day. To me, it's Groundhog Day. But you don't have to confront a reality of personal responsibility. And I think the personal responsibility is really lacking 
in so much of our population. You talk about heroes and knowing scientists. How are they going to know? They don't read books anymore, and if they're not getting it in school, they're certainly not getting it on the Internet. So how are they going to know about these heroes? True. And we remember when Rome fell, what was the response? Not fell, but when it was falling, the response was bread and circuses, welfare and entertainment. And we're just copying the Roman model. Well, I'll give you an example. Well for them. No. I'll give you an example. And I'm all for capitalism. I'm absolutely a capitalist. Capitalism has raised more people out of poverty than any other system that's ever existed and still offers more opportunity than any system that has ever existed. But when you start looking at salaries of people and what we're paying them, what are we rewarding? Is it truthfully a contribution to society or is it a sidebar of just react re- relaxation and escapism. Um, Patrick Mahomes, quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, great player, just signed a 10-year contract for $450 million. $45 million a year. Good for him. But what value we're placing on playing football, it astonishes me. You know, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it in the way you presented it, but, you know, they're mixing in materialism and consumption and making those virtues and making lots of money throwing footballs around is now the virtue. Uh, The old ideas of self-discipline and self-sacrifice are no longer virtues. It's all about wealth and consumption. So I just used to think of it as simply capitalism, but I can see how it hurts us as a country to glorify these folks. Well, and the children, Not- they become the children's heroes. And if you want to get out of poverty, you better be able to play a sport or be a singer or a rapper or something. It's not about getting an education or a skill and going to work. It's this fantasy land where, what, one in 100,000 will ever be a professional athlete if it's that low. So what does that lead to? Dream shattered because it's not realistic. Or remember, it was often said before, don't quit your day job. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, you may want to try that, but please have a plan B and a plan C. But they don't. Yeah. Believe me, if you have that kind of talent, (laughs) they've spotted it by the time you're in high school. It's not real hard to spot And, you know, you go play college football, you'll make it that way. But very few of those college players are going to be very highly paid professional athletes. It's not tons of them. And how many, yeah, and how many simply just get injured? Yeah, I mean, we can go on and on. Yeah. 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 Same thing with musicians, singers. You know, it's great if it's a passion and you want to do it, but get an education in the process, be it School of Hard Knocks, be able to rely on yourself, and so many people do, cannot rely on themselves, are not personally responsible for their own well-being. So when whatever they're doing fails, they turn to illegal activity, drugs, whatever it is, to ease the pain of their own failure. That's the right. problem. And many people turn to the government. You know, we've talked before about the idea that when there used to be a major problem in society, the first question that was asked but does the government have anything to do with it? Yeah. And, uh, and now the question is, what will the government do about it? So it's changed. And if the future comes to pass that we think will, you know, which isn't just our opinion, but based on these cyclical theories and, and, the, and the continuation of trends, uh, the government is going to have trouble helping itself. And if you're going to survive in that world, you're going to have to learn to develop plans A, B, and C because things aren't always going to go the way you want. Your ideal scenario is not always going to come through for you. So you have to have a backup plan, or as we say, don't quit your day job. Develop multiple skills, different ways of of getting by in this world, and you'll survive, 
and you'll probably come out in good shape. At least I certainly hope so. Well, there are things the federal government has taken over they should not even be involved in. It's not their role, but we never stop them. There is no system of checks and balances. They shouldn't be in health care. They shouldn't be in education. They shouldn't be in transportation. I mean, it's, it's, you go on and on. This should come from the state level. The community standards are different in different communities. Yeah. But we, I remember... I remember when they passed the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which we all call Obamacare, that people immediately said, if we don't stop this before a bureaucracy is formed, we'll have it forever. And, and we do. What? We do. Well, yeah. we did a number of shows on that when we were on the air doing What's Your Opinion? And I read so much of that. I'm probably one of the few people in the country who did. And I pointed out at the time how confusing it was. You would read two or three paragraphs, read the next two or three paragraphs, and it was totally counter what the first three paragraphs you just read. It made no sense whatsoever. And if I also recall, in that act, they set up various committees that would be in charge of X, Y, or Z, with no limitations on the decision making they could make. So that when they passed it, it was completely open-ended to be changed by these bureaucracies that they were going to establish. Uh, it was definitely a horror show. And uh, one of the things that everybody needs to keep in mind is that when you read the summary of a bill and what it contains, you may read a quarter of a page or half a page and that bill might be a thousand pages long. Oh, and it, what it's you probably amazing. read, yeah, what you probably read was just a PR piece from someone in the government, and no one had really done what you did and actually dig into this and say, does this make sense? Does it contradict itself? Well, there's a number of things. Uh, when Ob before Obama was elected, he said any major legislation he would not rush through; that it would be out there for everybody to look at. There would be committees to discuss it. This got pushed through in about three days. And then Nancy Pelosi says, well, let's pass it and see what's in it. Well, Bob, I want you to buy my house, and here's a contract. Go on and sign it, and let's see what's in it. You ain't read it later. Go buy a car. You want to read the contract later. It's the stupidest thing I've ever, well, maybe not. I could probably come up with some more. But when I looked at it, and I said, by the time Obama's out of office, these guidelines and also the charges for the silver, the gold, is going to double. And they exactly doubled, and people fled Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act because they can't afford it. And I found an uh, interesting statistic. Uh, and I'll go back to one of our founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Franklin, when asked about poverty. And in he was talking about you got to be careful about giving people too much. He said poverty should be uncomfortable because then they're going to rely on you if you don't. And I'll just take this one thing on health care. Uh, obviously, if you're at the poverty level, and in our state it's about $26,000 for a family of four, but you get $600 up to actually up to $660 a month on your SNAP card, that's 7200 You get Medicaid, which you pay no medical care, and the average health cost for a family of four that's employed is $28,166 a year. And I could go on and on and on. It's amazing. I see why you don't want to get off welfare and you don't want to make more money because you break that threshold, all that goes away and you've got to pay for it. I mean, yeah. why not? Well, and as we discussed earlier, part of the problem is that's a sign of a country in decline. And we're not saying, oh, this is America's problem. We're saying every time this has been tried throughout history to have an extensive welfare system, very shortly after that, there's been a failure of that culture or a decline of that empire. And many of them, it wasn't a matter of like a V-shaped recovery like they talk about with the stock market these days. 
it could have been hundreds of years before they actually got back to prosperity again. Well, The Dumbing Down of America, the book, and I'm trying to see who it's by, uh, it was, what is her, Department of Education, her last name is Iserbeth, I-S-E-R-B-Y-T, and I think Elizabeth is her first name. Uh, I have not read the book. I'm going to get the book and read it. I should have gotten it a long time ago. But And she talks about that and exactly goes into detail of what's happened. Now, if you have a dumbing down of the population, you have more of them who are going to stay where they are because it's not uncomfortable to be there. And then, and I'm a numbers guy, as I said before, yeah. when the, these number of people are complaining there are no jobs for them or whatever, white, black, it's it's all races. Um, but what are they going to do? What skills do they have if they can't, if two thirds of them don't have a, can't pass one core course in the eighth grade, what are they when they're socially promoted and even get out of high school? What job can they do, Bob? That's what's frightening to me. What are we going to do with these masses of people? If I knew the answer to that, I'd be a happy man. But what you're really saying is, is the, the cake is already baking in the oven. And uh, we're just going to have to reap the whirlwind uh, and, and deal with the issue. And it's going to be painful. You know, you know, we're saying in 20 years, according to all these theories, we have the potential for a collapse. But no matter what, there's going to be a very bad time. And I found it uh, revealing the three major ways of looking at the world and measuring what will happen all came up with the same answer. And some of them are like the, the Kondratiev ways. They, you know, they, not every economist agrees with them. Probably most of them don't. But that guy was a, a Russian economist who got sent to jail because he disagreed with the Marxist view of history. So he was pretty sure of it. And actually, it's been a better predictor than most economists. One of the things we often talk about is you can't rely on experts. They often have an ax to grind. For example, they almost never predict recession. And why? Because most of them are working at universities that their salary is paid by a grant from the federal government. Or they are actually government economists. So they're not going to predict a recession their job security would probably be in jeopardy if they did. Well, as far as experts, X is an unknown quotation, and uh, spurt is water under pressure. That's about what it <laughs> is. I, I don't trust them. Yeah. But I think yeah. what we're talking about, uh, not only with the education of young people and the population in general, we have something called the Internet, which is... I think a vast resource of information at your fingertips if you use it. And that's the question. Do you just read it and forget about it, or do you hack the truth on it? Do you dig deep into it? Do you look at it with an open mind and want to find some answers and some truth without accepting carte blanche just what you see? That's when you have an educated populace. I think we've just moved so far away from it. Yeah, if you don't change your mind on a regular basis and say, oh, I didn't really quite understand what was going on there. I have a better idea of it now. You're not looking. If you think you know all there is to know, then you're blind. You can't hear. Uh, you and I learn new things constantly in all the exploration that we do. Uh, and, and sometimes one of the fun things of working with you is that I now know a lot about aliens, right? And <laughs> it's not, it's yeah. much deeper a subject than you think at first blush. It's not just a matter of guys flying around in spaceships. It's really much deeper than that. And one of the things that you brought up, which just fascinates me the most, is there was a, that you mentioned the book that was written about how they were going to take over education, if the communists would take over education. And that it's not hidden. It's not in a vault no. somewhere. And, you know, we talked before about the rules for radicals by Solominsky. I mean, here's the guy saying, this is what we're going to do to you. 
I mean, nobody pays attention. The thing gets published a whole bunch of times. Nobody's paying attention saying, well, let's look for signs of that. I never hear about that by any government official. Or the news readers that you see on the newscast, and they're not investigative reporters anymore. They're getting paid a lot of money basically to read a teleprompter, and that's all they do. That, you know, they're getting paid their ten, twelve, twenty million dollars a year. You think they're going to rock the boat? Not at all. No. And, and so you can forget the media as being your source. That's out the window. Uh, and right. most newspapers are owned by six corporations in America. And that's why right. I say the Epic Times. At least take a look at it. You'll get a, a different viewpoint, whether you agree with it or not. But it's a different viewpoint. Remember the TV show The X Files. Oh, absolutely. I have the yeah, po- well, we used to have the poster behind us, but we don't. Right yeah, now. I was in love with Sully, I must admit. Yeah. But one of the, it's, its model was the truth is out there. And it really is. I know some things are hidden, but so much, if you look, you can find it. And you can't rely on experts. You can't rely on you know, press clippings and things like that. You've got to dig a little bit. Well, you do have to dig, and I think that's part of the exciting thing about if you can be open-minded, because then you start to discover more. I've often said, you know, when you're young, you think you know everything. We're all in that same boat, or we're so smart, and I always looked at it like, okay, here we're we're going to this point, and we get to the top of the mountain, and we think we know everything, and then all of a sudden, it does this. The triangle reverses, and we're down here, and we all of this out here, we realize we don't know a whole lot about this subject that we thought we did because now, by the time we get up here, we have some personal experience that goes along with the intellectual capability we have. And it's like, oh, I don't think I know everything about this subject. It's like reading a book on how to fly a jetliner, and, but actually flying a jetliner may be a little bit different. That's true. I guess I have to stop reading books on golf and get out there and play more. (laughs) Um, Well, that's one thing that never changes. No one will ever shoot 18. I will guarantee you that. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Well, yeah, yeah, go ahead. We just had the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And one thing I would suggest that people just consider doing, get a copy of the Declaration of Independence and read what our complaints were as colon- in the colonies against the King of England and see how many of those complaints are actually facts today. Uh, it will coincide greatly. It yeah, really and will. you realize the very things our, our, our forefathers rebelled against and were willing to jeopardize their lives and fortunes for, we accept uh, with ease today. And uh, and even to much greater degree because they lack the ability to interfere like uh, big business and governments can interfere today. Oh, most definitely. I think the crisis we truly have in the country today is spiritual, moral, and intellectual. And we really need to address that. And I do believe it starts with the education of the citizens and the education within your family. Because if you don't do that, Bob, it doesn't make any difference what laws there are, who's in control. If you don't have the intellect and the knowledge to oppose that, you're just sheep. And that's what we're becoming. And it's going to have to be a grassroots movement. I mean, one person at a time, one family at a time, one community at a time. And I don't see any other way that this thing, the, uh, the war of, of words and war of political ideologies can be won. And uh, as I've mentioned many times before, to me, there's only two ways of looking at politics, the people that want to control you and the ones that want to leave you alone. Well, and that's definitely yeah. on the side of being left alone. Well, I don't care what name you call it. Yeah, if you're tolerant of other people's views and will listen to them and not shout them down, and we've talked about truth and I'll end with this or we'll end with this. Rather than being living in a divided mind, this is good, this is bad, yes or no. And Justin and I talk about this quite a bit. Justin's on our board over there and uh, board of directors too. 
Let's say truth is here. Truth is at the top. Falsehood is here. Rather than getting on either side of it, if you'll listen to someone, we'll just say, for argumentative sake, on the left, and this is the right, there may be 20% of truth in what they're saying, and you may have 10%, or they may have 50%, and you have 60%. But there's some truth, I think, in what everyone says if we will listen. We don't have to totally agree with it, but at least take it into consideration their point of view. But that's getting stomped out, and that's very, very dangerous. Right. When we cease to think we have any common ground, we have very few opportunities available to us to to get together and find solutions to some very big problems that we're going to have. I agree with you completely. Well, we got some big problems tomorrow, Bob. We're playing golf, so we'll see how we do. <laughs> uh-huh. All right. Good. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. And we'll see you next time on Hacking the Truth. Well, we're back today on Hacking the Truth. I'm Jim Clements. Bob Wallace. How are you, Bob? I'm fine. Can you hear me that far away? Yeah, I can hear you that far away. Everybody's Good. doing remote, so they're they're used to it. All the yeah. newscasts, just about everything's going on is remote. But uh, the topic we're going to talk about today is UFOs, but we're going to look at it in a little different light. I have some personal experiences I'm not going to talk about today. That'll be a deep dive on the second part of this discussion we're going to have, but purposely, I gave you some information to look at, to read over, to watch, to kind of pull you out of your comfort zone, so to speak, of politics and things we've talked about for many years. And for those of you who don't know, Bob co-hosted my show on television for probably six or seven years or more. And we talked about a lot of different subjects, but we never had the time we wanted. It seemed like the 30 minutes went away way too fast. Well, we have a lot of time now, Bob. I uh, ask you to watch uh, one movie called Walking with the Tall Whites by Charles Hall, who was in the military, who had personal experiences at Nellis Air Force Base. And when you mention Nellis, it's Area 51, it's Groom Lake, it's all that combined with three different races of aliens. And first, we'll start there. When I asked you to watch that and you did, did you have this feeling of, wow, they're really here, or I've known this all along? How did it strike you? Well, I would say overall, there's a lot more evidence than I ever thought. And it wasn't just a one-second occurrence or a quick photo you snapped of a fuzzy object in the sky. He actually had almost daily contact with them for four or five years, if I recall. Although yeah, after that, I don't believe he ever had any more contact. You're right, he didn't. Yeah. And it, sometimes I felt there was almost uh, a purposeful attempt to humanize the aliens. You know, their love of their children and their care for them and their vulnerabilities. And also, he really sort of made them like people when he talked about them. Well, maybe they are more like people than we really well, imagine. Right. I've been seeing too many Predator movies, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, probably so. But that's when the amount, you know, what is imagination and what is real? I think that's what we, we're coming into now because people have imagined they have seen things in the sky. Things have been reported in the sky in the 1800s. And, and he said in his meetings with these people that they told him they've been here at least 8,000 years and sometimes much longer on the planet, which sounds like ancient aliens on television that we see so much. Well, I think it's pretty clear that when in the old, old days, they didn't have the concept of aliens. So they made all these folks gods and messengers of God. 
So well, many of the stories, that. I think, were about aliens. Sure. You would think that if you saw some craft coming from the sky, certainly it would be a chariot of fire, so to speak. Um, but in beginning to talk about this subject, you and I were kicking around the idea, what would society be like tomorrow if today the government finally came out and said, we've had contact for over 60 years, we have technology that far exceeds anything we've told you about. Do you think it would be welcome? People would be mad or they would be scared. It would be one of the three things. Okay. I don't think they would do it. The history of government is incrementalism. They do a little baby step by baby step. And if you notice, they took a large baby step when the Navy came out and not using the term UFO, but saying unexplored aerial phenomena. They had released three pictures or three videos. And my understanding is they had actually already been uh, sort of surreptit surreptitiously released. Yes, before. they had. Okay, so it wasn't anything really new, but what was noteworthy about it was at first, this is a government agency, it's the Navy. They're not saying, there are no such thing as aliens. They're not saying that well, these can be explained in some other way. They're saying, hey, something happened. We don't know what it is, but it's important enough that we're gonna develop guidelines for pilots reporting. That to me is a huge incremental step into normalizing the idea that there are aliens. Well, a lot of people say we've been normalized through movies, Close Encounters of the Third Kind which was actually based on a governmental movie that was supposed to take place. There was a film of aliens landing, meeting with our generals, and it was, we were gonna come forth. They were gonna admit it. So there was a script, and I forget the name of the Hollywood producer. I'll have to look that up. We'll put Justin over there on the board to look that up, and we'll put that in, we'll clip that in. But. On the day it was supposed to happen, as you may imagine, uh, you can shoot the movie, but you can't have the clip of the ship landing and them talking to the generals. That's out. Well, that was the whole crux of the matter. But the script existed, and someone gave it to Steven Spielberg, and that's the basis of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think what's happening maybe is we're transferring from fiction to fact. And... You'll notice that uh, a lot of other countries, when they want to do a big change in, in their uh, way of doing things, they have some relatively low-level person say, this is what we're going to do. The head guy doesn't do it. So we're sort of doing something similar here. The Navy's coming out and saying it. There's been some other, uh, like, uh, was it the radio? There's a radio bureau in the Navy. Not in the Navy, excuse me, in the federal government. And they're coming out and saying that, there is a great probability of alien life. So what's going to happen, we're going to get a lot of sort of low-key announcements before they spring the bomb. People aren't very good about major changes. They resist them. They automatically say no. So they're going to lead us to this step by step. And I, I think this is one of the first ones. I can't remember the government ever saying, well, we think there's credibility here. Something's actually here. We don't even know what it is no attempt to call it a weather balloon or anything like that. And we're going to try to develop better ways of, uh, of describing this. I think that's huge. Well, it, it is huge. And we talked about when something becomes common knowledge, we've talked about that before, but the fact is it's so much more accelerated than the fighter jet seeing a scout craft that I'll give you, and I've talked to you about this example. I did a radio show uh, for a lot of years from nine to one here in Jacksonville. I got a call one day and Jim Brower, who was on the board said, Jim, this uh, fellow from the military wants to be on your show. He's in town for a meeting. He's just wrapped it up and he's, I can't tell you who he is. He said, X, Y, Z. I said, well, why would he want to be on my show? I mean, uh, okay, fine. Uh, so he shows up, he's in the, the black car, the government, he's the fourth rank guy in the Pentagon, 
He's got a driver. He's got a guy with a weapon that stands outside the studio when he's in for the interview. And I, I kept thinking, this is the strangest thing. Why would this man even do this? Well, we talked about what he did in the service, and I can't, I can't tell you that because you'll know when I finish the story. And so did the interview. And, you know, he built up the branch of the military he was in and pretty much just common talk. But spread out on my desk, imagining I did four hours a day on the air, I had this one section there, which is UFOs and flight saucers. This was 1980. And there was one picture there, and it said, his favorite food is ice cream. And it showed a gray alien, the kind with the big eyes, and there's a window, and there are three military men standing there looking in the window. Now, this was a drawing. It wasn't a picture. And uh, now we were off the air and done with, done with the interview. And he said, do you really believe in all this? And I said, oh, I do believe in it. I have firsthand experience. He said, that's interesting. He said, do you see that picture? And he tapped it. See that guy right there? I said, yeah. He said, that was me. I looked at him. I said, that was you? He said, yes, his favorite food is ice cream. So we had a, a little discussion there before he left. And he said, I'm going to give you a few bread crumbs, and you can follow these bread crumbs, but you can never tell anyone you talk to me about this. I will deny it, and it could cause you a lot of problems. I said, okay, that's a deal. But with the breadcrumbs he gave me, and I'm not going to say exactly what they were, but he did leave me to find out where that underground base was, where the Greys, and it's in Dulce, New Mexico. It's an underground base, and they've been there for a number of years. And there's, if I remember correctly, about 700. And I remember when he was walking out, and I said, well, I hope it's a good thing. And he turned around and looked at me, and kind of stared and said, I'm not so sure. And that was it. So that, at that moment, 40 years ago, I knew it was much deeper than even I thought. So I started searching and finding other information. And I thought the biggest breakthrough we had was when this book came out, the day after Roswell, Philip J. Corso. He worked on artifacts from the Roswell crash, tells the whole story, and I won't go into detail, the parts that came in, they went to Hewitt Packard, different places to find out what they were, because they didn't know what they were, fiber optics, a number of things. Went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list, Bob, and you never saw an interview with him. CBS, NBC, so that's, uh, that's how deep the cover-up is. Well, I guess the next answer is, why are they loosening up now? Because I believe the evidence is so strong. They're loosening up now because of another book right here, where you have generals coming out, where you have people, ex-military people, believing that it's wrong that they signed these agreements. They would not talk about what happened when they see what's happening in the world, that we could purify the water, that we could have energy. One of them said, these crafts, some of them are powered by a power cell that's no bigger than a matchbox. So you can imagine how much power that is. All of these things the government has used to develop other craft for deep space travel. Basically, he told me that NASA was a dog and pony show. They're so far, they're, hunt, they're four or 500 years behind of what we're really doing in deep space projects and dark space projects. You know, I read somewhere that the next habitable planet by us is 31 light years away. Mm -hmm. And if I recall, a light, a light year is one trillion miles. That's pretty far. No, excuse me. Is six trillion miles. Six trillion, yeah. Yeah, and that's pretty far. Uh, so uh, they would have to, we, someone would have to have the ability to not just travel fast, 
to travel even to the speed of light would take you forever to get there. No, it's faster than the speed of light. And Charles Hull described of the three aliens, the tall whites were the only ones who could only go the speed of light. The other two went faster than the speed of light. But when you get to that point, then time, energy, space, and matter is really an illusion. It's beyond what Einstein thought. Yeah. And, you know, I've done a little checking, re reviewing what I used to know about these things, that just to put it in perspective, if you can only go the speed of light, if you had a spacecraft, you could go around the equator seven times in one second, all the way around the world. That's spinning like uh, a top. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like when you start working with these numbers, it's incredible. And that was one of the things that, uh, that I found was, do you remember Carl Sagan? Of course. Cosmos. Yes, he was, he was a great guy for poking holes in other people's theories and saying that they believed in idiotic things, but he believed in the probability of aliens. And what's interesting to me is he died in 1996, and he had made that prediction well before that. And the truth is, let's assume that, let's assume that we don't know anything about aliens for a moment, and we just decide what is the chance there's aliens. Right now, the world and the universe, I should really say, is so much bigger than Carl Sagan ever knew. We've discovered that the natural laws of science apply throughout the known universe, and that there's RNA, which is the building block life, is everywhere. So we've had these three big uh, new pieces of information that on top of what he already thought, I mean, it's almost like a sure thing in Las Vegas that there's aliens out there. Well, the other thing, when you look into the night sky and you see the stars and the planets, you think everything in between is just nothingness. We're finding out it's full of information. There's a current running through everything. It's just not nothingness. Well, the other part of it is everybody talks about the Big Bang Theory. Now, if you think about the Big Bang Theory, that happened, I think, 14 billion years ago. I remember, yeah. Yeah, and we've been expanding at the speed of light for 14 billion years. That's a pretty big place. Right? It is. It's huge. And now scientists, see, universe actually really means everything in creation. But we don't really use the word that way. We use it to mean everything we know that's out there. So they're beginning to think that maybe there are multiple big bangs out there, not just one. So it, it's gotten so that the universe is so huge, so full of everything, that there's no way that we're the only intelligent life anywhere. It's just oh no, it's in my imagination. It oh, there are probably thousands or tens of thousands of civilizations. There's no doubt about that. But on this planet, they have been visiting, if they if it's correct in what they say, eight to ten thousand years at least. And I know they've had personal relationships definitely in the late 40s and all through the 50s with a number of people. And there was a movie I asked you to watch, uh, The Friendship Project, about a group of Italians that actually made contact with people, actually helped them. They, act, <laughs> they told them to go to a spot with their cameras and they would fly by so they could get pictures. I mean, it sounds incredible. And they kept all of this under wraps for all these years. And what's interesting to me, it was a give and take relationship. They needed help from humans and humans got help from them. Yes. That's one of the things that I, I, we haven't talked about that I'd like your opinion on. Are aliens actually smarter than us? Um, that's a good question because you gotta have to define what smart is. Well, just the fact that they're technologically more advanced than us, they could be a million years ahead of us in civilization and actually be slower than us in the rate of invention. That's true. And what we come to know is common sense. What really just applies in a certain situation, they may be so intellectual that they can't put that together. Yeah. I because one of the things that I wonder about is why do aliens bother to come here? I mean, I can't really see any great benefit 
from everything that you asked me to take a look at that they got out of staying in what for some of them is a, a fairly hostile environment. I remember reading about uh, Charles Hall uh, and he said that people were, the, that he saw were afraid of a bumblebee might bite them. Yeah, and they're, they're have dramatic are effects afraid. on them. So yeah. this is a dangerous place for them. So why are they here? It's a way station when they travel the universe. And he defined that as they need to work on their craft. They have problems with their craft. They need uh, certain elements that the Earth has. That's why they visited and stayed here. And no, they've been in colonies on Earth under Antarctica. In fact, I've got, I don't know if I brought the book here, but yeah, I did. U.S. Navy Secret Space Program. These are people in the military coming out telling you they've worked on these programs. This is not just some dream of someone. They're still, their base is under Antarctica. Uh, in fact, I think there was a Nazi base at one time, but I'm, and to what you're talking about, how smart they are, I think they finally figured out Hitler wasn't the good guy they were thinking, and they split from Hitler. Uh, all the technology the Germans had just wasn't happenstance that they had the U-2 rocket and they were developing the jet engine way before we ever thought about it. Do you, in the stuff you have read, do we have resources that they don't have that they come here to get? Or is what we have commonplace throughout the universe? That's a good question. I don't know that. But I know our environment, and we have what we call the Nordics, which favor cooler weather, and they're in Antarctica. The desert is very favorable to some of them, depending on their home planet. And the military in trade outs for what they need, whether it's a, a way station to live here, what they get technology. But what I found interesting, they will not give them the technology, will not give us the technology for deep space travel. They don't trust us. And can you blame them? We have about 300 ongoing wars on any day around the planet. We're In a virus. Very, We're talking yeah, about coronavirus. We're the coronavirus of the galaxy, buddy. <laughs> we are. Well, for, from what I remember, they have actually have 17,000 recorded wars throughout history. And we're That's engaged continuously in the United States with some military action somewhere in the world for the last, I don't know how many decades. Oh, yeah, not surprising. And many we don't even, tribal wars we don't even know about. They go on every day. See, one of the things that I, I wondered about is why do people resist the idea that there's aliens out there? Are they afraid of aliens? If you remember the history of Europe, which is basically the history that most of us have, is one of colonization, exploitation, uh, stripping other societies of everything of value that they have. And as humans, we project our past onto aliens. So maybe a lot of people think that aliens are predatory, just like we're predatory. And if we have technological superiority, we'll exploit that. So they'll exploit it. Well, we talked about, or we kicked around the idea, okay, tomorrow, hey, there's a press conference that's on every TV in the world. They're here. We've been working with them. Think of the foundational institutions that are based on feelings, imagination, non-reality, and I'm talking religion. Uh, and I, I'm not against any religion, but the fact is, if you're saying if this happened in whatever time frame and this is the, the great guru of this, oh, by the way, these people have, have been alive for 80,000 years before we were ever on earth. What does that, the foundation, I would think, would just be destroyed. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure. Uh, I remember the story about explorers coming to America and finding Indians. And according to the knowledge that existed in Europe at that time, they, there was no other races. So that they knew that if they went back and said, oh, we found another race, they probably could burn at the stake. So they actually brought Indians back to prove their point. And you know, it, it, 
you're right. Every, every religion has a cosmology. This is how everything got to be the way it is. And aliens would sort of be opening up a door in the middle of it and saying, hey, guys, we're here. And it's not going to fit their story. Not, not, so not. that's going to be a big problem. Well, I definitely think so. In 2008, the Catholic Church uh, released a directive of saying it's okay to believe in extraterrestrials. And I believe the reason the Catholic Church did that, they know they're extraterrestrial. They have information. They have insight. And they're trying to basically get ahead of the curve because this is going to happen. How, how are we going to construct something that fits us back into this picture when it happens? That's a stretch. I don't know how that's going to happen, but there are people who will accept anything on blind faith. There are people who think the earth is four or 5,000 years old and it's still flat. I don't know what to tell you. You know, actually in my readings about aliens, I came across the flat earth idea. And apparently, that's been exaggerated. The intelligentsia, whatever you want to call them, or the Middle Ages, knew that the Earth wasn't flat. But the commoners thought the world was flat. And somehow we took that idea and said everybody was that way. So they really did know that. And, you know, the, one of the things that was remarkable to me was Copernicus deciding that without any instruments at all. That's the part that's cool. He had no instruments. He just had his senses. He determined that the earth revolved around the sun. Now, you have to remember, as we forget sometimes these things, our original view was that the earth was the center of creation, and all creation revolved around the earth, and that we were the pinnacle of God's creation. Well, the aliens may uh, upset all that idea. And uh, Copernicus, you know, was backed up by Galileo because he actually had telescopes. And so he could add more proof to, to that idea. But there was great resistance and there was danger to your life to hold such notions back in those days. Both of them were placed under house arrest. And I think Copernicus finally signed signed off saying it wasn't true what he said because it was going against the Pope, basically. Yeah. And I can see aliens being demonized, you know, that they're minions of the devil and all this kind of thing. Uh, I don't know how bad it would be. It depends how frightened people get. People attack what scares them. And I think that's one of the things that people are, who know for sure about all this, are concerned about is public reaction. No. You know, you and I have talked about government again and again, but one of the things I've been toying with is the government actually is afraid of us. They realize there are too many of us, and if we all got together, they would be in deep trouble because they live, they live amongst us. They're not like in some of the movies where they're, they live in some space station or, or planetoid up above the earth telling us what to do where they're safe from us. Right? So they are actually afraid of us. And they're very well, careful. You wouldn't know what it. They do. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason, and and that's one of the reasons. And we're going to do a show one day on uh, Saul Alinsky's book, "The Rules for Radicals," and you'll see what has happened in this country is outlined in the book. But when you fragment people, black and white, rich and poor, and you keep them divided, that's what the government wants to do because they lose their power. All right. They would no longer be top dog. No. And we may not be top dog as people if aliens do turn out to be smarter, more capable than us. So that's why I wonder about some of the descriptions that I've seen of aliens being weak and all that. Maybe they're trying to allay our fears that aliens are dangerous, that they're really predators in disguise that will be hunting us for sport. Well, you know what false flag means. A lot of people sure. felt 9-11 was a false flag just to take more of our rights away, which they did with the Patriot Act. We could do many hours on the Patriot Act. It's not for patriots, believe me. But what about this scenario? There are people in the government, people in the military, in these deep space programs, 
And the, look, if we're missing $21 trillion from the budget, it went somewhere, okay? Over the past 30 years, there's $21 trillion. They said, we can't find the receipts. I can say, <laughs> it's laughable. We know, I do know where it's going. It's going to black ops, deep space programs. What if the people in government, the generals and whoever's controlling, I don't think there's one person anymore. There are groups of people saying, we're not going to tell them because then we lose our power. We're giving the power. The aliens have the technology. They're going to be the top dog. Then our people are going to revolt and they're going to be mad at us. So we're going to do a false flag because we already have the triangle crafts that so many people see, they're ours. We've back engineered those. So we're gonna do a false flag and scare the hell out of people and they're gonna need us even more. So we're gonna keep this from them and say, we've got to do this, you've got to do this cause the aliens are here and they're coming. Well, if they can do it over a virus, they can certainly do it with aliens. Uh, you're right. You know, maybe they're setting us up for the big sting. Yep. Yeah. So. But with all these people coming out in the different books, and here's another one, the Majestic Documents. And this was one of the early ones, the Majestic 12. And when we're talking about people in government wanting to, there were 12 people on the Majestic panel. And one of them was James Forrestal. And you may know the name, Forrestal Aircraft Carrier. Sure. He was the one of the 12 who at that time, and you can imagine in the 50s, wanted to tell the whole story. They're here, we're working with them. They did, Roswell's real, we're doing the whole thing. Uh, mysteriously, he was, he went crazy and jumped out of a 12 story window at a hotel or something. Buddy, he didn't jump out. <laughs> they gave him wings when he said he was going to come forth and, and break it to the people. He was too dangerous. Yeah, I guess one of those things they always check for is how many feet away did you land? If it's like 15 <laughs> yeah. or 20 feet, someone gave you an assist on your way out the window. And, the, and there's also a, a number of people who believe Kennedy was killed for that reason. He wanted to know. He started as a senator. In fact, on Project Blue Book, the television show, which is really good, he came in and it was an excerpt of the Project Blue Book papers where Kennedy wanted to know about a certain thing that had happened at sea when a spacecraft came up out of the ocean and it was witnessed by so many people. He wanted all the ins and outs of it. So he was really deep diving into this and he wanted to know all about it. And I think he scared a lot of people. Now, we've heard a lot in recent years of the term the deep state, and people defined it in different ways. Uh, is this, does this have anything from what you've read uh, have to do with aliens? Are they in cahoots with each other, or is it mainly just the government itself and only parts of it? I don't know. I don't know how much it's intertwined because there's so much now. I used to think there were just one, say we've got uh, the false government, which, you know, if you think your vote really counts, okay, go vote. But the people who really control the power, basically the bankers and the people who create the money, which is the treasury, they really control what we have. I used to think there was another level, maybe even two more levels. I think it's an onion. I think you can just keep peeling it, keep peeling it because there's so much money who's, that's come into these projects. I know the Army, the Air Force, the Navy all have three separate projects going on and they don't like each other and they're trying to develop their stuff. They don't share information. Uh, so it, if those three don't get along, uh, does anybody get along? Yeah. Well, you know, you and I have talked once sometimes about the concept of useful fools. And I, I find it hard to imagine that aliens would make good useful fools. And I'm hoping that they could see through any attempt to manipulate them uh, or to use them for one group's advantage against another, you know, to win a war or, or that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping the aliens are at least that smart and they're not just you know, been around longer than we have. Sometimes when I consider that 
almost all our advances have happened in the last 500 years, which is just a snap of the fingers for uh, geological time. And we've done just astonishing things. And if we don't blow ourselves up or ruin the world or uh, you know, become an extinct species through our acts, which I would like to remind everybody that almost every species that's ever been on the earth since the beginning is extinct. It's something like 80 or 90% sure. of all species are extinct. And there's no reason to just assume that that couldn't happen to us by either ecological damage, uh, nuclear war, and various things like that. We're actually pretty fragile. And that's been shown by this, uh, the, the virus problem that we're having right now about how dependent we are that the first thing that we think of is running to the stores to buy toilet paper. I mean, what level of preparedness does that show you? So, uh, you know, it's, I, I've been trying to think if I could ask an alien for something, what would I ask for? And the obvious thing we always hear about is technology, right? Faster planes, better weapons, I don't know, secrets about the physical universe. Clean water or whatever. Yeah. yeah, clean water, whatever it is. You know, maybe you can have a, a, a farm that will produce 20 times what we know how to produce from a farm. Because one of the things that you and I've talked about is we actually are very vulnerable to modern farming. If for any reason we couldn't do, you know, petro-based farming, they say one third of the people in the world would have to die because we couldn't produce enough farm if we could no longer use petrochemicals and all those products to produce. So I think maybe a plan B would be a good idea for that. And maybe that's something aliens can help us with. But the thing I would really ask aliens for is to help us increase our awareness. In the modern era, we have learned how to use brain waves and associate them with awareness states. Uh, there are chemicals, I think they're called nootropics, NOO yes, tropics, yes. okay, that can uh, augment our memories, uh, make us so we can learn better. Now, this, these are relatively new sciences, you know, binaural beats. Again, I'm not sure I'm saying these things correctly, but. It sounds uh, very hippie to me. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, we're sort of at the beginning of this, and they may be at the end of some of this. And if they could boost our awareness, perhaps we could deal with a little more technology and not misuse it. Uh, the history of the world is that every new technology seems to be misused before it's properly used. Well, I believe this is a reason they would not give us the propulsion secrets to travel the universe because we not only not intellectually, but spiritually responsible for what harm we could do. Like the prime directive from Star Trek, you don't interfere. You, you have a high moral code. You have, it begs the question, going back the last 50, 60 years, are we better off spiritually? Are we worse? Are we as moral? Are we less moral? Or have just the media and the television shows and the movies which are so violent and sexual and all the things that we never had as children because it was they just didn't produce them in any norm which it's just out there everywhere a child now goes into an adult world when they're 12 years old and they can't handle that so if they look at us have we gotten better bob I think there's a, I don't know if that's exactly the right question. To me, what's happened is all the external authorities that impose morality, impose shame on people, those have largely lost their power. And so now it's up to us as individuals to make the decision to be moral instead of it being imposed on us by churches or, or the state or our communities. Certainly, you know, I remember things that nobody ever talked about when I was a child, because these are just things that um, we don't talk about that. You know, there's a lot of elephants in the room back when we were young. But now, you know, I, I saw a movie the other day where a guy spent the night with a young boy's mother 
And here he is about six years, you know, maybe like eight or nine years old. And he said, well, did you all have sex last night? And the mother, of course, is alarmed by that. And he says, mom, I, I, I'm a, I go on the internet. I know about these things. Maybe he shouldn't know about things like that. No, I don't think he should know about those things. Because even though you can say the words, you don't know the meaning of the words. I love when I see parents trying to reason with a two-year-old. I'm, you're trying to reason with it. Well, they said yes. Well, they understand at the level of a two-year-old, not at the level of a thirty-year-old. And it's so just, when aliens so when aliens look at us, do they see two-year-olds? Uh, no, three. <laughs> <laughs> but getting back to that question, if you had one thing you could um, ask them, would to be increase our awareness? Right, because you know we've talked about before. We have this weird physiology that we actually have three functioning brains in our yeah. heads yeah right and one of them is basically related to instincts another one's basically related to feelings and the other one is our cognitive functions and there's always been a debate about who's driving the bus uh, and it seems like mostly the first two overpower the third one in most people you know, another a little thing I came up with is, is, is related to this. We've heard all our lives that we only use 10% of our brains, right? Now, I checked into this just for fun. I tried to, make, you know, fact check some of the things that we could talk about. And apparently, that's not true at all. You uh, use 11%, to, I can tell. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, they used to say we use 10, Einstein uses 15, right? Yeah, right. But no, it's... We do use our whole brain, but we just act like we only use 10%. Uh, and, I, uh, and if aliens can spur us along and give us a big boost, you know, maybe we can then take care of ourselves. But then we go back to what you talked about, and that's the Star Trek Prime Directive, which is to not interfere, not play God, let each, each society develop on its own. Don't try to make it the carbon copy of your own society. Let it find its own way. And maybe for better or for worse, we'll end up coming out with something that's relatively uncommon in the universe. I hope so. We've certainly gone through enough growing pains. In the, uh, like, what, the 20th century, we killed 100 million people. I believe that we have all the tools here we need without anyone's help if we want to increase our awareness I look at our awareness, if we increase our consciousness and not be so body oriented about our feelings, our body, the looks of our body, and we redirected that energy into learning about who we really are, then we would have that inner morality. You wouldn't need any kind of commandments to tell you what to do. You know what's right instinctively. I just really feel that, but we're individuals and we're not created equal. We got to get rid of this idea that we're created equal. We are not equal. We're equal as souls, but we're, as far as reincarnation and birth and experience, we're not equal at all. Right. I mean, we should be equal in the eyes of the law. Okay? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and, 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 right. But it's just as individuals, right. We couldn't be more different. We were born with completely different uh, capabilities, uh, backgrounds, experiences, and all the rest. But so, we place so much value on our positions in our possessions of saying, well, you must be so smart or you're privileged or you're this because you have that job or that much money. But let me tell you, we're in tr when you're in trouble and you want a plumber, you don't care. <laughs> you know, that I've always said, if I would, if someone, landed and said, if you want to uh, point to a group of individuals who are the most responsible, who have common sense, and who, what group of people would you say if they're asking me? I would say, you go, go meet some farmers. They grow crops. They have to get up when the livestock gets up, when the chickens get up, when the cows get up. They don't take vacations. They, when something breaks, they fix it. Those are some of the, you know, people call that dumb farmer. Well, let me tell you, you'll have food when you don't. He knows what the earth farmer? is. Pardon? 
Jim, who said dumb farmer recently? People will say that. Dumb no, no. Farmer. Someone said it recently, a politician. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Okay. We're going to give them a, a slide? Yeah. yeah, one of my partners, Mike Askew, grew up on a, a dairy farm in England. He said, Jim, there are no days off. It's every day. It's 14 hours a day. The cows got to be milked. They got to be fed. They got to be clean. And then when this is personal responsibility at its main level. But anyway, that's what I would ask. Well, while when we continue this, we're going to do some interviews with some of the people in these books that we're going to put online. We're going to put a link to those books. And then we're going to really deep dive into it with these people and hear their stories. I mean, the foreword to this book, UFOs, was from John Podesta, who was in the Clinton administration and also with Obama. I think he was chief, chief of staff in the Clinton administration. He does the foreword to this book. He wants things to be released. He knows it's there. One of the interesting things I ran across was Harry Reid. He was the Senate Majority Leader during the time of Obama. Not one of my all-time admirable people. And he <laughs> even said that we would be short-sighted to think that we're the only intelligent species in the universe. Yeah. That yeah. floored me that he came out and said that. A political animal who's aware of er the, the ramifications of everything he says actually came out and said that. Yeah. And... Uh Leslie Keene, who's the investigative journalist, I said, uh, I thought at one time I wanted to do a, a book and just talk to generals and everybody and get the story out. Well, she's done it. This is a great book, and we're going to put a link to it. If someone said, Jim, what should I read or watch? I would say definitely Walking with the Tall Whites. And Charles Hall has a number of books, with a, uh, about a five series, uh, The Millennium books and uh, we'll put links to all this on our broadcast at the bottom of the page and also i'd like to remind the people please uh, subscribe and click the like button and bob we'll deep dive into this at a later date sounds like fun okay talk all to right. you later and we'll see you next time on hacking the truth Thank you for joining us today. Hacking the truth avoids the superficial, simplifies the complex, and reveals the hidden truth behind today's deceptions. We rely on personal experience and fearless fact-finding to bring the undeniable truth to you, no matter how uncomfortable it may be. Would you want it any other way? And now, here is your host, James Trinkle Clements. Welcome to Hacking the Truth. Uh, please subscribe to our channel. You'll see the little button there on the screen. Uh, my guest today is someone I know very well, Michelle Clements Coward. And I guess you can guess by the middle name, it's my <laughs> daughter. And not only do I want to talk to you about a lot of things, we're going to talk about the business you're in and the travels we've had together and the people you've worked with in the movie business. So tell a little bit about yourself, dear. <laughs> okay. Hello, father. <laughs> um, um, I'm your only daughter. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, my, well, my occupation is I work in uh, costuming in film and television. Um, I work uh, on commercials sometimes, but lately mostly in film and TV. And... Um, it's a, it's a pretty interesting gig, and I've been able to travel a bit and meet some fun and interesting people, and that's what I do for a living. <laughs> Located in Orlando, obviously. I live full-time in Orlando, that. yes, with my husband and kids, and uh, two dogs and a cat. <laughs> it's a full house, especially during quarantine. And, well, um, that's right. Yeah, we're doing this during quarantine. 
quarantine. Yes, so you're there with Alan and Chet and Ruby. Yes. And we've and all been locked down for a while, which was slightly boring after a while. But we're getting out. We actually went to the beach this morning for sunrise. We did and saw a beautiful sunrise. It, it was, was great. It was so good. And it's so good to see you after two months. I know. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. We'll talk about what you do now, but... Was your start when you started working on my television show that I had when uh. I had you running the camera? You remember that? Of course I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, um, you know, you, you kind of threw me into that in a good way yeah. because you wanted me to see what you did and to be a part of it. And I always had an interest in that. Um, and so you put me behind the camera and... I don't know what kind of camera it was. I just remember. It was a big camera. It was a big camera, yeah. and it was a heavy camera on a tripod. I do remember once, because and I did. it rolled around. I learned how to dolly and pan and all those basic moves, but I remember once that I unlocked it a little too loose, um, and this was, was it live? Yeah, we were live. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 weight of the camera as I was loosening the knob um because i was going to you know do a little creative camera work and go left to right um the weight of the camera just went <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden i was filming the cement floor of the studio that's right i remember being so, i mean i still remember that today i was so horrified just well, it didn't knowing break. that i had made a mistake well, yeah. You must, yeah yeah but there's always a lot of mistake in production but when you go live there are really a yeah. lot of things that that, that can't happen. be undone, but no, you know. that can't be undone. <laughs> yeah, when I started that show, uh, I actually started on CBS affiliate here in Jacksonville, and then cable came to town, and they asked me to bring it over to cable, which was brand new, and I really didn't want to do that. And then they said, "Well, we'll give you an hour and a half show live." You got me. Yeah. So that's how that whole thing started. And that was how many years? That was started in 1980. And the show changed as cable had changed proprietorship and different things mm. happened. And got, so it got down to a 30-minute show. But it was live call-in for an hour and a half. Yeah. I remember you had the, you know, the the old-school rotary phone with the, the buttons that lit up yeah, when people called in. People yeah, people called in. That's going <laughs> way back. Started and uh, did that show from 1980 to 2015, 35 years. Yeah, that. That's a long time. A long time. But what's interesting to me is that um, when I've told my friends or coworkers about your show, because it is one of the longest running cable access shows in history. Yeah. And there's very little on um, YouTube or, you know, if you Google what's your opinion, you really, really can't find anything. No, it's, um, well, when it was started, obviously there was no internet to speak of. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there were computers and they were just coming of age, yeah. but we really never posted anything. We never promoted the show where it would, you know, be picked up. I did have an article in Fortune magazine. Uh, you and, did? I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, had an article in Fortune magazine and also uh, with one of the people who I became very good friends with, Ted St. Martin, who's a world's record holder in free throw basketball. You were living in New York, and we, oh, were, yes. on, we were on Regis and Kathy Lee. Yeah, Ted St. Martin. Okay. I yeah, was remember to think that? of his name, and I couldn't remember. Yeah, oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. and Regis yeah. and Kathy Lee, and met them, and were on that show, and that was nice. And mm -hmm. so a lot of good things happened, and I met a lot of, well, people who were stars then who many have passed on. Mm -hmm. So that, that that was a great segue to the show, and so did you, Jay Thomas. Yes, yeah, who, I know. I have that photo of of me and Jay on my fridge. <laughs> and uh, he it's went on to well, Mark and Mindy and Cheers, mm -hmm. and he was a DJ in LA. Great guy. He Passed was away sweet. probably two three years ago. Yeah, it's way too young. Yeah, way too young. But. It, it was a start, and I did want to expose you to that. And also, I worked at an advertising agency at the time, and you would go with me when we would shoot commercials. Yes, and I maybe remember. that piqued your interest. I just wanted you with me at the time to see yeah. how oh. things were. No, it definitely did. And to see that that was possible as a way to make a living, you know, because you don't really see that, or at least not in Jacksonville. 
not like you you know people that are working actors or or you know work on a crew necessarily so um so yeah it kind of kind of opened my eyes to that as a possibility well i thought you would have fun if nothing else and obviously mm -hmm. you did in meeting the people uh and seeing how production worked which is much more tedious than it is today we're sitting actually in my house which i've turned into a studio to yes. do hacking the <laughs> truth and on youtube and also our channel and so it's just this is an infancy right. we just started it and you might know the minute you start something the whole country gets locked down and people are going to interview obviously aren't coming here and i'm not going anywhere but you have to deal with those kind of things yeah yeah it's a strange time for everyone so tell our audience when you first got into costuming and explain what costuming is because it's it's a different niche that when you talk about it, even I didn't know till you told me the amount of shopping, the amount of work it takes to do it. So explain what you do. Okay. Um, well, the way I got started um, is uh, I moved to Orlando from Philadelphia, where I lived for a few years. And um, this uh, Nickelodeon Studios was a it was a, a working studio within Universal um parks and um in the late 90s uh i it's, i talked to young people now pas that i work with on shows and i mentioned that i worked on uh keenan and kel and all that uh, which are, were big in in the time and um and you know they're <laughs> it's it's makes me feel old but they're like oh that was my favorite show when i was a kid but that's how i got started i worked at uh worked at Nickelodeon I came in because we had friends that worked there and it was just word of mouth and I got a job working in the art department and basically as a PA and a PA is a production assistant and you just do whatever is needed but I would watch um, and and all of these shows had live audiences which was great too so every they would um, you know have a table read on Monday and rehearse the rest of the week do a dress rehearsal on Thursday and then Friday afternoon have a live show with an audience and they just bring in park goers um, to come in and watch. And uh, and so we all would just stand in the back of the soundstage and watch as well. And so just from talking to people and... Now, Keenan and Kel, mm -hmm. Keenan's on Saturday Night Live right Kenan now, Thompson, correct? yes. He's, yeah. He's on Saturday Night Live. Seems yeah. like a great kid. He He's wonderful. I mean, I haven't seen him much uh, as an adult but he was he was a great kid his his mom was always on set with him and Thompson and um, he was just a really cool talented I mean you could tell I mean you obviously have the talent you, you just don't know what's gonna happen in the future but but I'm so proud of him when I see him on Saturday Night Live now it's um, it's pretty cool because I knew him when he was a kid. I mean, I remember when he got his driver's license <laughs> and started, <laughs> you know, had his own car and drove on set for the first time and stuff. But, um, but yeah, that's kind of neat to have had my start there. And it was the perfect place to start working because it was so much fun. And I just fell in love with everything about it. And so. did you work at Disney before or after that? It was, um, it was a little bit before. It was kind of, it, um, segued into each other yeah it was, it's uh, I mean I did start initially at Nickelodeon and then um and then I had my my first child you know you know Chet yeah, I do know Chet yes <laughs> and so I took I took a few years off and then when I went back um I did I went to Disney because at that point um all of the shows all of the Nickelodeon shows had uh moved out to LA and so, um, and I did do one season of all that in Los Angeles, but we didn't end up moving there. So stayed in Orlando. And after Chet was born, I worked for Disney for a little bit. And, um, but slowly those, those kind of full-time costuming and production jobs were going by the wayside. So eventually I just became a freelance um, person and, so then just started working wherever there was work. Now, let's have you explain your day. You've got your own, let's say, a movie, a, a television series. It's a period piece, a 
or it's not mm-hmm. a period piece. What do you, when you get up and you shop for the clothes specifically, or are they provided, or does it depend on depend on the production? Um, well, it very much depends on the production. And when you're talking about movies or TV, um, the jobs are very specific. There, um, there are shoppers, and all they do is shop. And I'm, uh, I'm mostly in in the movie world. I'm a costumer, so I work on set. I will dress either principals or background, depending on whatever role I'm playing at the time. And um, and uh, so I, the at that point, the costumes are already provided. They're shot for. They've already been fitted on the actors. Um, everything is is set. Um, all I do is is prep the the costumes or the wardrobe. Um, I make sure that once they're dressed, that everything looks perfect. And then when you're on set, your major job is continuity to make sure that, um, you know, small things like if, if it's buttoned up to the second button, that it stays there. And the, the, you know, if there's a tie, it's straight and, um, just all of those things because you shoot out of sequence, especially, um, a TV show or a movie, you're, you're not going to shoot it in chronological order. So you also have to make sure that if this actor was wearing this specific costume for uh, day one, scene three, then three weeks later, if you're also doing day one, scene three, they have to be back in the same costume. And you're not the only one that, you know, is responsible for making sure they're in the right thing. But and you right. have a supervisor and people look over what you're doing, obviously. Right. And a lot of people don't know that. Tele- television shows, the t- movies, they're mm. not shot the way you see them. You could no. be shooting the ending at the start of shooting. Absolutely. It's going to depend on weather, timing, mm-hmm. other people's schedule, their work schedule. They could be doing TV and doing parts in this movie. And right. there, there are times these actors never even see each other, and people don't That's understand true. that. Yeah, if they don't yeah. have scenes where they're physically together yeah that you could work on the same show and if you're not in a scene with that actor then they you know they never, might not see, never each, see other. each other yeah. yeah and a lot of it yeah it depends on if it's exterior shots and you know you may go to whatever the place is and shoot all of the exterior shots for the whole season and then um go back to the sound stages and shoot the rest of it so it's yeah, it depends on so many factors. So you you never shoot in sequence. So well, I do know you worked in I think mainly commercials to begin with because you did about every Tiger Woods commercial with American Express mm-hmm. and various <laughs> various things that you you back do back in the, the heyday. <laughs> back in the heyday, and Alan, your husband, does the lighting on David Faraday's show. Yes, he does. And talks about that. And that's a golf show for people who don't know, and they have just about every golfer or mm-hmm. media person who loves golf. It's a very good show, one of my favorite ones. Let's talk about when you started doing a lot of work that did leave Central Florida for various reasons, and we could do a lot better in our film community to bring more work here. I used to be involved in that when it first started, but it seemed to have gone by the wayside. But Georgia has become just a tremendous place to shoot movies and television shows. So right. you do a lot of work in Atlanta, or out, around Atlanta outside. Right. Talk about that. Um, yes. Well, for me personally, about four years ago, um, the work here in Orlando slowed down for me quite a bit. And so I, uh, I just kind of did a little research and I already knew a few friends who had moved from Florida to Georgia and, um, talked with some of those friends and other people that I had contacts with in, in the costume business. And, um, just from that, I, I eventually, after a few interviews and visits to sets and things like that, I I switched from the Florida Union to Georgia Union because you have to be in the local union of that state to work in that state. And there was just so much work there that um, I I went to Atlanta. So I I basically live half of the time in Atlanta. So I have two homes now. Um, and um, it's been a great experience. I mean, I, it's and also 
even though at that time, that was four years ago, which is quite a while, um, Florida is slowly coming back. There are, uh, in the last two years, there have been several episodics that have come to Orlando. Good. One is a, an yeah. uh, Oprah Winfrey produced. It's called David Makes Man. Okay. And um, that I've heard has done really well. And uh, another one that I think is going to air very soon on uh, Nat Geo is uh, The Right Stuff. Um, so that's an episodic. Which, like you like the right stuff movie, right? Oh, I'm gonna right. love that. I love one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, yeah. So look for that. That's um, I don't know exactly when, but I know the trailer is already out. So they're they're promoting it. So it probably will be streaming soon on Nat Geo. And I know a lot of people that have worked on that. So um, yeah, there's there's it's it's picking back up in Florida. It's I don't think it's possible for it to be quite the boom town that Atlanta is because they just have such an infrastructure. They have so many uh, sound stages and studios and, and honestly they've been doing it for over 10 years now. And Tyler Perry is huge, uh, you know, a huge presence. His, he has two studios yeah, I don't, there. I don't, I think they missed the opportunity yeah. when it started fading away. They didn't capture it. Georgia picked it up. Like you say, a lot of influential people in the media live in Georgia. Yeah. And live in, around Atlanta. So that's right. really helped. Um, but it's, uh, I, li I like to see more of it come back to Florida because we are unique in what we have. No, I agree. I agree. Especially yeah. North Florida here, which, you know, because you can, you can have uh, the landscape of Georgia um, with the pine trees and and, you know, you can also have the ocean and everything is, is within like a 100 mile radius. It's, it really could be. It lends be. itself well to, to movies I think and television. So. You know, <laughs> talking about Florida and hoping a lot of movie business comes back here and also comparing it to Atlanta. I was in Vancouver and they were shooting a lot of movies yes. in Vancouver. So it, it's really Huge all there. over the, you know, North America, but really in the South. It has really moved to Georgia. So let's talk about some of the the projects you've worked on that are near and dear to your heart and some of the people you've met that really made an impression upon you. So we can talk either current ones or one leading up. I know you were on Fast and Furious 8. I remember that. Yes. Now, that was my first movie in Atlanta. So I was a day player. So that means... A day player is not a full-time crew member, so you don't work every single day. You uh, Typically, for costumers, a day player uh, dresses background because there are certain days where there's going to be a lot of background and they need extra costumers to dress those people. So, And, and a day player can be an actor, too. If you just come in, um, you know, like say you're a cashier in a, in a store, you might have a line or two, or you might not, but you're a day player. So that was, that was my, my job on Fast 8. I was, uh, I dressed background and, and there were a lot of big background days with um, military and um, just crowds and things like that. So now, who were some of the stars in that movie? Oh, well that, I mean, there were uh, it was a lot of big names. I mean, obviously Vin Diesel and Dwayne Johnson, um, Fast Eight had Charlize Theron, um, Kurt so Russell. You, oh, Kurt Russell! Kurt you Russell. really like Kurt Russell. I loved Kurt Russell. I mean, I—he's one of those people that I've always loved as an actor, and and seemed to be a really genuine, down-to-earth person. Uh, and and so when you when you meet or in some way come into contact with someone that you've looked up to then it's uh, it can either be devastating if they're not what you had hoped they would be but in his case he was he was he was that and more i mean he was very down to earth he shook everyone's hand introduced himself as if i wouldn't know who he was and um but he was very just just the ultimate professional i mean you could tell he'd been doing it his whole life and he also i what i noticed about him is that even when he wasn't in the scene. He would still be on set. He wouldn't run back to his trailer. He would be on set, either going over his lines or just just 
sitting there watching and and still learning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, still he was learning. very cool. He was he was And I think you called me or I talked to you during that production and you oh, said I'm sure. Char Charlize Theron mm -hmm. had a malfunction yeah, or oh, something right. you had to do something on her dress. <laughs> right. Well, and I volunteered to help, but I couldn't get there in time. <laughs> you could not get there in time. No. Well, you know, obviously she has her own costumer and, you know, her, her own hair and makeup people, but there was a there was a stunt scene between uh, her character and Vin Diesel's character. And there are, are stunt people that do the, you know, the actual stunts, but they were you know, they're in the scene too. And um, just like things that will happen, her, her zipper busted and she's wearing this leather cat suit and, and there's no time to change her into a double of the suit. They're in the middle of this fight scene. And so it's just, you know, it happens to everybody. The zipper just comes apart and you have to rework it. But in this case, cameras holding everybody's waiting and so we all and it was probably only my second day on set and i you know i was a little bit starstruck i've never been you know within two feet of of these people and but we all had to help and so one person held their phone and had the flashlight on and somebody else held the garment together while her costumer was trying to uh, get the zipper working. Get the zipper working without yeah. having to take the whole thing apart and resew it. And by by some kind of uh, magic or miracle, we got her zip back up and were able to move on with the scene. But that was we were all sweating bullets. But it was cool when it you know when it when it happens. And then the best thing that can happen is that you just don't uh, you don't hold up camera. That's the big thing is don't hold up camera because money is being wasted and. Everybody's waiting, but that's when it, that's when it's so nerve wracking is when everybody's waiting and everybody's watching you. <laughs> the tension. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to tell you the other morning, my golf jacket zipper did that same thing and <laughs> nobody helped. Did no me. one show up? No <laughs> one. You didn't show up. I'm there. It's, you know, with it's. All you had to do was call up. dad. I, and know, I, would have been I there. know. That happens. <laughs> I know. That it happens, happens in real life and it's no big deal, but. Yeah. And so you went from that movie, and there's been several television series and other movies. What are some of the ones that really left an impression upon you? Um, well, f as far as personal experience, one of the f my favorite shows, one of my favorite uh, experiences uh, was the uh, Dolly Parton series, Heartstrings. And mostly because I got to meet Dolly Parton, who was one of my idols. and um, I love Dolly. I love Dolly. I mean, yeah. who doesn't love Dolly? Yeah, who, she's Something's somehow. wrong with you if you don't love Dolly. And one of the greatest songwriters ever. Absolutely. People don't know how many songs she's yes. written. And just her, her voice, just her speaking voice. I mean, just to be on a soundstage and hear her off in the distance talking. She has that, that little girl angelic voice, and she's... I mean, friendly doesn't even begin to describe it because she would go out of her way to introduce herself to every department and thank every department for their hard work. And she was always making like self-deprecating jokes. You know, she, she, I mean, she's famous for her sense of humor and she just was everything and more that I dreamt she would be. I mean, if possible, I was more in love with her after uh, working with her and she showed up on we were shooting the very first episode and we were maybe two days in and she showed up on set and there were rumors that Dolly's here Dolly's here and uh, she surprised we had a we had a lot of background that day it was a big courtroom scene and um, and Kathleen Turner was the the actress the star of this particular episode but uh, Dolly comes out from behind the the set and the place just goes wild and and she just thanks everyone for all their hard work and um and and she would and I saw her time and again like she she wasn't part of every single episode or she didn't act in every single episode but she was she was there quite a bit and um and for the episodes that she did perform in she was always singing for the for the extras for for everyone um, just always, she would talk to people like they were her best friends and it was, she's special. 
Yeah, she, she's very special. She really is. She yeah. really is. And um, being in the business myself and interviewing hundreds of people over the years, uh, there are people who I looked up to and interviewed and did not have that experience. Right. And then there are others it who are, you know, they're human beings. Mm-hmm. It, it's the same thing. Some of them are going to be very caught up in what they do and who they are. and But it always seems the ones who are the biggest stars actually have the le- lesser egos because they don't need, they're just not that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think it's very specific to the person yeah it, it is true you just you don't know what you're going to get but and and people have bad days and it doesn't necessarily speak to who they are um as a person always so but but she one thing i noticed with with dolly is that she always made time for people um i i sent you the photo of our costume department with dolly and that day in particular was it was close to the last uh, day of shooting. We were on the last episode, and everybody was scrambling to get a photo with her. And um, every department uh, would would gather around her, and she'd take the photo. And then she'd think she was done, and then somebody else would want a photo with her. And as the costume department, we were kind of waiting by the sidelines for our turn. And I would see more and more people and think, she's going to get tired of this. And and just our luck, right before it's our turn, she's going to say, okay, that's enough. I'm tired. And and that would be fine. I mean, if she had, but she didn't. She Until everybody had their photo with her, she she stayed there. In that's her, great. In her, like, eight-inch heels and her tiny little outfit. I mean, she's the smallest person I think I've ever seen. Well, it's great to hear those stories and people hear that, she is everything you think she is. She's that kind of person. And if you haven't seen Heartstrings, it's great. It I is. It really is. Really, look it up. In 2017, for your birthday, mm-hmm. we went to Hollywood and we went Did. to the Turner Classic Movie Film Festival, which was three days, I believe. We flew out there yes. or more. We stayed a week, didn't we? Yeah, we we stayed, we stayed at least four or five days. Yeah, we stayed out yeah. there and saw. We were hoping to see Robert Osborne, but he happened to pass away just a couple of months before the festival. That's so sad. But we spent time with Ben Mankiewicz, who is now the premier host of Turner Classic Movies. Mm-hmm. And that was a great experience to go out there. It was. What was your impression of that overall? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I loved every second of it. Um, and, and we had... We had the VIP experience, thanks to you, and which was which was lovely. And but we've talked about things that we thought they could have done differently or improved on. But but just the just not only seeing movies on the big screen, classic movies that I've only ever seen at home, but the uh, the Q and A that they would have before or after with either the director of certain movies, uh, Peter Bogdanovich, and uh, and start. I can't remember all the movies that we I, saw. I know, but... and I'm trying to remember. <laughs> and but like you say, before every. I mean, the Graduate was the feature of that. Yeah, the festival Graduate was. That year, um, but... Michael Douglas Jr. was there. No, Michael Douglas. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. Yeah, it was with yeah. Michael Douglas. Yeah. He, we didn't get to see him because he was down the street. You can't get to see everything. There's right. so much going on. Yeah, and so much going on at the same time. You have to pick and choose. Yeah. And we saw Dick Cavett. He gave a talk, which was very interesting to hear about his experiences. And uh, Lee Grant, who talked about being blackballed in Hollywood right. during the whole communist thing that went on, which was absolutely crazy. It was interesting to hear about that. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just movies. You got a lot of, you can say, backlot uh, conversation about what sure. really goes mm-hmm. on in the movies and has for years. And watching some of the old movies w- was great. It was great. And w- we saw um, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane at the Roosevelt Hotel poolside. And that's where they had the first Academy Award celebration was at mm-hmm. the Roosevelt Hotel. Yes. And we were out there by yes. by the pool and that they played it. That was amazing. That was, I mean, that is true old Hollywood. Yeah, it is. Yeah, most definitely, and they had. That's a where nice... I'd like to stay next time if we do it again. <laughs> we'll do it again, uh, and we had a um, 
pool top party at one of the hotels. I can't even oh, remember right. where it was. And yes. I, that was that was nice. That was fun. And then we, uh, one of your friends is a director. Trish C. And Pitch Perfect 3. She directed Pitch Perfect 3, yes. And we went over to her house for dinner mm-hmm. and with a group of other people, yeah. obviously. She has the greatest family and house. Oh, they do. House and they are, rather. Yeah. yeah. We, we had a lot of fun. That was What fun. a great house. Mm-hmm. And yeah. all the stuff she and her She's husband got have. Very eccentric. Chickens and Everything fish running around. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're all set for the quarantine because they... they between their garden and the tilapia and the chickens with the eggs, they've got, you know, they don't, they don't have to probably ever have to go to the grocery store. <laughs> no, I bet they don't. And, uh, yeah, and Rue is an amazing baker. He makes bread. He, you know, he mills the grains himself. And it's it's unbelievable, the, yeah. the stuff that he He gave creates. me the lecture on dead bread. You yeah, don't want dead that's bread. That's right. I know. <laughs> and, and I I take it to heart every time I'm there because it's, it is, it's like night and day from the bread that you buy in the grocery store. And then I, I think I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. And then I get home and you know, <laughs> life happens and I don't do it. <laughs> Let's talk about, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about different things you've been doing last night, when we were sitting around talking about Ozark mm-hmm. and some of the television productions. Talk about that. Um. Okay. Well, uh, the I guess the most recent things, or two of the most recent things that I worked on that are actually streaming now on Ozark is on Netflix. If if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's third season is streaming now. Um, and I, but again, I I date shows, so I jump around. So I I haven't necessarily worked on all of these shows all the time, but I get to work a little bit on Ozark for season three. And then um, The Outsider, which is another uh, Jason Bateman-produced production, as well as um, Ben Mendelsohn, who stars in The Outsider, which is very, very good. It's a, a, based on a Stephen King novel. So those those are two of the most fun things I've done. Even though they're, the subject matter is kind of dark, it was, it was fun for me. And yeah, I want to start Ozark. I, yeah, you really I, I watched need to. one of them and I really liked it. But then you've got to say, I'm going to do this and sit down and start doing yeah. it. Because if you don't, you just. Once you start, I mean, you pretty much, I think, get sucked in from the very first episode. It's it's intense. And I know I wasn't, which I'm sure most of the audience, when it first came out and you just have no idea what it is and you start watching it and it's, um, uh, and then Jason Bateman's character he, I don't think, had really ever done anything like this before. And so that was surprising, too, to see this this guy who's usually in comedies and, um, you know, him for maybe Arrested Development. And, and then he's this very complex, kind of not always the good guy. Not always the good guy, no. <laughs> character, so it's pretty yeah, cool. That's good. And is that around Atlanta, all that also? Yes, yes. There are... Both of those were shot in and around Atlanta, and there there is a lot of great locations, especially because you know Ozark obviously is set in the Ozarks, but it's shot around well the exteriors anyway. Most of it's shot around Lake Lanier in Georgia, outside of Atlanta, and then um, most of the rest is on a soundstage in um, in Atlanta. So it's it's amazing what what they can do. <laughs> It's uh to it can be almost anywhere, any country, any any state. So as far as upcoming projects, I assume everything's pretty much on hold and yes. you haven't heard if Heartstrings is gonna continue for another season or you think it is? Um well I heard rumors that it was and I assume that it probably probably will. Because she, I mean, I don't know how well it did as far as um, ratings or or whatever on Netflix, but um, she's so popular that most of most of her content is well received. So I think that uh, it was kind of the assumption that it would continue because obviously, well, every episode's based on a 
a song of hers and she's got oh my gosh hundreds of songs in her um in her library so there's there's a lot more to be tapped so i think i i mean i think hope it would come back but um yeah for now i mean we it was really like a light switch one day i was working and then everything shut down and we just had to stop and walk away so and it's still a big question mark when we're gonna come back let's talk about some of the people you've worked with um and there's a movie you worked on which still hasn't been released and we wonder if it ever will be <laughs> with robert de niro mm -hmm. and what was the name of that movie war with grandpa war with grandpa yeah it was based on a uh i don't i can't remember the author of the book but it was a um a young person, like a uh, youth novel, um, and uh, that had done really well. And it's a great story. Um, it was, I mean, it, gosh, three years ago now I worked on that. It's been a very long time. And, um, but Robert De Niro, um, Uma Thurman is in oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, Cheech Marin. <laughs> oh, of Cheech and Chong. Yeah, Cheech and Chong. And Christopher Walken is oh in it. So, yeah, I mean. It, it could get creepy with Christopher <laughs> Walken. He's, he was awesome. Um, but, but yeah, it just, uh, I, I have no idea. Every once in a while, I'll Google it just to see if there's any hint that it's going to be somehow released on some platform. Uh, but I, I don't know. Yeah, there, I know that there were, at the time, um, an article came out and it listed War with Grandpa as well as there was a movie starring Nicole Kidman and there was another movie, like all big name projects that were shelved because of uh, the um, coronavirus. Yeah. Well, no, this was Weinstein. Oh, the uh, yeah. Harvey Weinstein yeah. production. Oh, right. Okay. Right. That's what's holding it up. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, those just went away and, and so, so many years later still haven't been released so i don't know i guess it's gonna have to be uh maybe purchased by another production company well i or... understood his production company he was selling it or forced to sell it i would and, imagine and so. picked up by someone else and all those intellectual properties who know yeah i mean well the actors they've been paid they got paid for their work. Oh, yeah. It's we got all, paid. <laughs> you, you got paid so the movie's yeah. sitting there so somebody needs to make recoup some of that money, I would think. So hopefully it would. I uh, would think so at some point. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. There are some things that you just never that never see the light of day, and you don't really know why. So. Yeah. Now you worked with an actor who just recently, in the last few days, passed away, Brian DeHaney. Uh, what movie was that, or was it a TV series he was on? Um, he he was in. Uh, well, I worked with him on a series called Happen Leonard, Brian Dennehy, and he um, he uh, played a, a retired sheriff in this community, a southern, a su old southern gentleman, and uh, I I worked with him pretty closely, and he was he was lovely. I, I mean, he was crusty and and didn't you know. It, at that age, didn't have much of a filter. He let you know if he wasn't, didn't want to do something or, or wasn't happy with whatever was going on. But uh, one of the things I remember about him, and I know I've told you this, that he he did not like the cowboy boots that he had to wear that was part of his, <laughs> his costume because they were uncomfortable. And um, so many times in a shot, I would try to give him his cowboy boots and he would say, I'm not going to wear them. I'm just not going to wear them. And he had these sneakers, these puffy white grandpa oh, oh sneakers, sneakers yeah, yeah. with the Velcro across the front. <laughs> and that's what he wanted to wear. And yeah. he'd say, you're not going to see my feet. I'm fine. You're not going to see my feet. So most of the time he got away with wearing his his sneakers. But that's that's my favorite memory of him, that he just he hated those cowboy boots. <laughs> he was a very good character actor. Yeah. And he was also in First Blood with Sylvester Stallone, and he played a sheriff in that. One of yes. my favorite. One of those movies, if you're channel surfing at night and it comes on i just have to watch it like roadhouse or there's certain ones you've just got to watch yeah yeah for sure that pull you in you know goodwill honey god if it comes on i go here i go two more hours i've got to watch this 
Shawshank Redemption, those kind of movies. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, that movie's famous for being on TV once every two weeks or yeah, something, it but it is. It's yeah, one yeah, of the greatest one movies. One of the greatest ones. So right now everything's, you know, most businesses, we're starting to open the country up, uh, but we talked about it earlier when we finally start getting back and you're getting back to shooting whatever television series. We don't know how all that's going to change, how many people are going to be, how do you feed people now? There's not going to be people going through lines grabbing their food. I mean, all these things that have to be worked out, it's a lot of work just to figure the logistics of a shoot now. Right. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that is the great unknown, even though there are lots of... Um, documents coming out and um, guidelines that we're seeing from different production companies, uh, how they're trying to set up uh, how they're going to do things. And um, everybody has a different idea. I heard that Tyler Perry is go going to quarantine his entire crew. Now, I don't know if that's true. I read an article and who knows, but I mean, he definitely has the, he has two production uh studios uh in atlanta one of them is a is a former either an army or navy base so there's there's housing on site wow so he could technically do 